Okay. Hey, um, kia ora to everybody. Morena, it's uh, lovely to have you all back around the council table. Um, and I am uh, going to hand over to Melissa, who's going to introduce our guest for our workshop this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, yes, Morena, everybody this morning. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome in uh, Brad Olson. Brad is the uh, Chief Executive at Infometrics. Um, so we're welcoming Brad in today in the context of the long-term plan. Um, so the next phase of the long-term plan project will be really starting to look at um, projects, prioritisation of those projects, um, and we'll be taking a bit of a deep dive into our finance and our infrastructure strategies as well. Um, so uh, the information that Brad will share today is really just to help support um, that thinking and those discussions as well. So I'll just hand over to Brad. Thank you. Kia ora. Good morning, uh, everyone. Fantastic to be back. Fantastic to be back in person. Uh, in fact, I feel like although I know that Zoom is very convenient and I've done a few with the likes of uh, the exec team and what have you, it's actually nice to be back in person. Uh, spent yesterday in Cambridge and then this morning uh, over here in Te um, What I'll go through for the next sort of um, 40 minutes or so is, is what we're seeing out there in the economy, uh, both in terms of the national and sometimes global trends and also some of the more local trends uh, that that will be affecting Waipa District, um, including um, what we're thinking around costs and similar. Um, if you don't mind, I'll hold questions until the end only because I have a knack of answering them a few slides uh, later. There, there is a little bit of a method to the madness, if you will. Um, I guess to start with, look, we do think we do find ourselves in challenging economic times, uh, both uh, locally, uh, across the country, across the world. Uh, inflation has uh, been high, it's been persistently high and uncomfortable for a number of people. And the medicine that we have to take uh, for it to try and get inflation under control is equally as distasteful. Uh, higher interest rates, although they are working, certainly uh, don't feel good when you're having to pay significantly more on the mortgage uh, and you're increasingly having to make difficult decisions around where you put your money. To start with, though, I think uh, I wanted to zoom out uh, and to think about the team of uh, 8 billion globally, which does trump our little old team of 5 million here domestically. Um, and that's because we are seeing that it's not just New Zealand that are facing those tougher economic times, it's the rest of the world as well. US economic activity, for example, is expected to be fairly flat um, this year. And more recent numbers out of China, New Zealand's largest trading partner, uh, has highlighted that their economy is fairly sluggish. China grew 0.8% uh, in, in terms of GDP quarter on quarter. Um, now, we expected that coming out of COVID, there'd be a few rough bumps, uh, but at the moment, things are back to normal as much as possible in most of, of uh, China. People just aren't spending quite as much. Their property market isn't going as strongly. They're not demanding as many goods from us uh, as they had before. Uh, so again, that's a real challenge. Now, I think last time we looked, uh, we estimated perhaps 40% of YPAR's exports might well be somehow directly or indirectly linked to China. So um, having that global perspective is increasingly important. And we know that the geopolitical tensions are uh, still there as well, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, but equally those uh, concerns around sort of uh, the Pacific in Southeast Asia, um, you know, with, with the likes of China and uh, the US also uh, continually discussing their different points of view. So all of that becomes uh, more important, especially at the moment, given that we are now at the moment nearly as exposed to the world uh, as we've ever been. Um, you'll see on the chart on the screens uh, New Zealand's current account balance. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the details there, but suffice to say New Zealand is spending a lot more with the rest of the world than we're currently earning in. Uh, and it's that, that, that deficit uh, at 85 odd percent of GDP uh, is near the worst it's ever been. It was slightly worse at the end of 2022 at 9%. Those figures are the worst since the 1970s oil shocks. Uh, so at the moment, how, how the rest of the world responds has a much bigger implication for the New Zealand economy than it did before. We are, however, starting to see some better gains on the domestic front when it comes uh, to inflation. I think that's encouraging given that at one point you sort of wondered if we would ever get inflation back under control. It seemed to be going up and up. And then when it stopped going up, it certainly didn't feel like it was coming down particularly quickly. Um, so again, some better news coming forward there. 
The first and best one is that people's expectations around inflation are also easing. Now, that's important because if you get into the situation where businesses and households think that inflation will remain higher and higher over time, it starts to affect their decision-making and, in fact, usually means that inflation will be higher and higher over time. If I told you all that tomorrow the price of gas was going to go up by $2 a litre, what would you all do? Rush down to the service station and buy it, which would mean that there wouldn't be any uh, additional fuel available, there'd be a huge amount more demand, and you'd actually push the prices up, uh, which would create the inflation that you were worried about in the first place. So the fact that you're seeing here that um, a bit of a decline coming forward in inflation expectations two years ahead, um, again, just suggests that people are of the view that, yes, it's hurting at the moment, but there is belief that inflation will come back down over time. That's encouraging because it means we're not getting that embedded level of inflation. Thankfully, those... Um, Expectations are also being driven by real inflationary data, uh, which is moving into a better position over time. The latest inflationary numbers coming in at 6.0% on an annual basis. Uh, now, I think probably importantly at a profile that there are some good things there. Um, you know, the price of international airfares have come down. Good if you're leaving New Zealand. Um, the price of fuel came down and then went straight back up, uh, given that the government has removed their fuel tax subsidies. However, it's the essentials, I think, that worry us the most. Uh, we're seeing the likes of food uh, cost inflation rising at its fastest rate in 40 years, uh, energy inflation running at its fastest pace uh, in a decade, rent still running at about 4% per annum. Uh, so those households that are unable to adjust their spending as much are very much uh, being hit. What we see there as well is what we're thinking uh, might well be sort of a hot core of inflation. So yes, inflation might well not stick at that 7% number, uh, but at the moment, some of the figures do imply more of a 4% annual inflation rate uh, and not going as quickly below. So you'll see on the forecast here, we're still expecting that inflation comes back over time. I would, however, profile that this uh, is good if you're a household and if you buy the likes of bananas and similar. Uh, if you're a council, you don't buy many bananas, and so the CPI is... Uh, useful indicator, but certainly not reflective of your actual costs. Now, I'll show, I'll show you some um, civil construction costs a little bit later, um, but we'll also be providing through um, to uh, staff uh, our thinking around cost expectations uh, for the years ahead and, and through the LTP cycle. And certainly, as you've already experienced and you'll be getting through in your finance papers and similar, stuff costs a lot. And if you're in local government, stuff costs a lot at a worse rate almost than households. Um, so that is likely to be a persistent trend, certainly not at the levels you're seeing at the moment, but also... Um, if you're waiting for things to get back to normal in terms of prices, if you're waiting for them to drop down to where they were before the pandemic, you might well be waiting a very long time. Uh, we don't think they go up to the same and in, in, uh, increasingly frantic pace that they have been recently, but we also don't think they go down. All of this is to say that the Reserve Bank does think it's finally done enough to bring inflation under control. Um, of course, by the time you actually see inflation under control, uh, that's affected by stuff you did a long time ago. And so there's a feeling that there is that lagged effect from interest rates coming forward. Uh, but you'll see here the Reserve Bank's uh, expectations and certainly our own forecasts uh, for the official cash rate to basically be done. Now, um, that's, I guess, good news from the point of view of you don't think it goes up anything or interest rates go up too much higher. We've seen a little bit of movement uh, for fixed mortgage rates as international pricing pressures remain high, uh, but you'll also see that we're not expecting they go down particularly quickly either. It's one thing to take your foot off the brake. It's, one thing to, uh, it's another thing to slam it back down onto the accelerator. And so in our view, uh, those interest rate tracks remain high and persistently high relative to the very low periods uh, through COVID for quite an extended period of time. It's probably until mid next year that um, the Reserve Bank thinks they can drop interest rates. Uh, again, what they'll be worried about is, is stoking inflation back up. And there is an open question about whether the Reserve Bank has actually done enough. It thinks it has. And to be fair, I probably agree with them. Uh, but they'll be nervous if they continue to see things that don't support that narrative. Uh, that headline inflation figure of 6%, that's helpful. Some of the underlying figures, though, the likes of New Zealand uh, domestically based inflation are uncomfortable. We've got labour market data coming out this week. If they don't see those wage pressures coming down over time, if they don't see uh, sort of a more normalising of the labour market starting to appear, they'll be going, we probably need to do a little bit more. In our minds as well, though, if the Reserve Bank needs to do more, they're probably not going to pull that trigger until November this year. One, they won't want to go before the election because it looks political, even if it's not, but also they probably don't have enough information until November to say they're definitely off track. And so at the moment, they'll be waiting to get that confirmation over the next few months. 
The other big change that we're seeing in the economy is a huge uh, lift in migration. Now, if I was doing this presentation to you last year, uh, when the brain drain was going on, I would have talked to you about how I'd lost all my friends in Wellington. That's still true. Uh, I've got lots of uh, couches to surf on over in the UK if I ever go. Um, but we did, we saw a huge, um, uh, we saw the largest outflow of New Zealanders uh, from New Zealand on a net basis since the global financial crisis, the Australian mining boom and the Christchurch earthquake, uh, earthquakes all combined. Now, We've now seen a huge shift in the other direction, a huge lift in people coming into the country. Uh, that's, uh, I guess, a good and a bad thing. On one hand, it means that we are able to secure more of the talent that we need. On the other hand, if you go back to when we last had these high levels of migration back sort of 2015 through 19, at a time when we thought the housing market was a bit cooked, we thought that infrastructure was a bit hampered. Uh, you look at the likes of the healthcare system now, if it's difficult to get into the ED and, and not have to wait six hours now, you add an extra 70,000 people into that and uh, it's pretty clear what happens. So good and a bad news story, a little bit on the migration front, it is adding additional labour capacity, but it's also adding, if you will, more pressure. Now, if all of the uh, previous slides are true and, and we're seeing, you know, the likes of inflation getting back to normal, but we're also seeing those high interest rates creeping up, there's not going to be as much work to go on in the economy relative to what we might, might have previously thought. So you'll see here that we're expecting a big up and then a fairly fast down as well uh, for migration. And that's just because at some point uh, there is going to be a, a view that there are not as many people that need to come into the country because no one lands at Auckland Airport and goes, gosh, now it'd be good fun to find a job. They normally have a job pre-prepared. If there aren't as many jobs going around, we'd expect that migration would generally follow that. Just one other point on migration I think that's probably important locally, uh, and that's that when we see high levels of inward migration like we're seeing at the moment, generally that favours our uh, metro areas, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch. They come into those areas and stay first, and then eventually over the next few years they might filter out. That's what we've seen previously. However, that brain drain that we saw generally took from just about everywhere, provincial areas, rural areas, and metro areas. Um, so there will have been uh, still, and, and I'd expect that still to be the case, a uh, challenging environment to find staff uh, locally. Probably not as intense as it had been, say, six months ago, but I don't think you'd sort of walk around town and find five people uh, readily available to work uh, three seconds later. So there's still those concerns, I think, around uh, the labour market supply. What are we looking at locally? Well, we know there, there are some strong foundations across the Waipa district, but at the same time, as everywhere is seeing, there are some challenges uh, as well. Brief recap uh, on what we're seeing, because uh, I think it's always important to set the scene on the structure of the economy. Uh, funnily enough, yes, a large uh, focus on the primary sector uh, coming forward there, talking nearly 14% of employment uh, in the year to March 2022, which is the latest uh, uh, detailed data that we've got. Uh, higher level of construction and manufacturing and retail trade as well than the national average by um, various margins. Uh, but it's encouraging to see that high level of professional scientific and technical services um, sitting there in sort of fifth position. Can I count? Yes, that's fifth. Um, I say that because increasingly that's the group that are working from home, they're able to be a bit more mobile and the fact that they're looking to call Waipa home uh, and there is that sort of work coming through is important. It's often an area as well that we see greater levels um, of higher productivity work emerging. Uh, so just I think gives you a bit of a uh, an idea of where things are likely to uh, move the dial for Waipa. It is going to be generally in those top five areas a lot more than otherwise. Um, just to note as well, the uh, slightly lower level of health uh, employment in the district relative to the rest of the country is generally sort of a provincial versus metro thing. Um, from this point of view, you've got um, the hospital in, in Hamilton that has a much greater outsized focus, for example. What have we seen recently? Um, well, over actually over time, a fairly strong profile in terms of economic uh, activity. And I think probably important here, you'll see that WIPA did avoid uh, the the much larger hit that the national economy took during COVID-19. That's not to say it was easy, uh, but you can see that the economic results here point towards the, uh, towards the hard amount of work that went uh, through those various times uh, and to see growth of nearly 5% per annum coming forward after still pretty strong levels through COVID um, again reinforces that there is a lot of momentum behind the white power economy at the moment. Also encouraging to see uh, strong levels of employment growth coming forward as well, um, and importantly for Māori uh, coming through in the local area, Māori employment has been stronger since the GFC and Waipa uh, across uh, the last decade or so. So 
that's encouraging. There's always more work to do, um, but I think important to acknowledge that there is a greater diversification uh, of the workforce emerging, and, and that's both um, as the economy expands, but also through um, a number of, of targeted initiatives and, and similar. And so that last figure of nearly 8% growth for Māori employment really does show um, just how much pace there is behind it. To more local figures, so um, some of the figures I've shown you there are all up until March 2022. That's the latest detailed uh, information that we have, but we also um, do our quarterly reporting. Uh, what you'll see here is um, at the moment, if I were to show you the latest annual changes in uh, local economic activity, all of the South Island guys look way stronger than they should because they had not a lot of international tourism at all during COVID, which means that now they are getting a lot, they look quite, quite strong. Now, of course, that comes after a big drop. So what I've done here is looked at where uh, we expect that economic activity is relative to pre-pandemic levels. And you can see here uh, that WIPA, uh, if very difficult to put all 67 TLAs on a, on a chart. Here's all the regions plus you guys to sort of give you an idea of where you're sitting. Uh, you can see you're sitting in that pretty high position. In fact, uh, relative to pre-pandemic levels, Waipa's economy is the 14th uh, best growing of uh, all 67 local council areas. And I think that reflects, look, um, that there was a lot of fast momentum anyway going on in the district and that has been able to continue over uh, the last wee while. Um, I guess I'd also just profile that I think the area's come a long way uh, or continues to come a long way over time. Um, I was driving back through from New Plymouth over the weekend with some friends. Uh, we stopped off and had a great lunch over in Piao Piao and, and as we are driving through, we, we hit what I knew to be the outskirts of Te uh, They had no idea. They hadn't driven through before and they sort of said, oh, it's a nice little town quite like this maybe we should you know have a bit of a look around now to be fair um i'm not sure how quickly they'll move given the um the, the first home buyers as well but i think it, it was sort of instructive that you know people are now making those sort of comments uh, a lot more and, and certainly um you know the likes of cambridge and tiamutu come up in conversation a lot more than they pro probably would have previously so again that momentum is not only showing through in the numbers but also in people's recognition uh, of the area You'll also see uh, here that generally speaking, regional areas are uh, sort of regional provincial areas coming through stronger, um, the likes of Auckland and, and similar a bit further down, uh, lower on the chart, a little bit less momentum in metro areas at the moment. One of the reasons that there is such strong economic growth at the moment is because people are willing to spend. Now, we can go through all the technicalities of GDP and the current account balance and what have you, but if you and I are going to get our money out and spend uh, in a local area, we've obviously, one, got the money to do it, and two, got the confidence to put it out there. You'll see here spending activity in the March quarter alone was up 8.2% on the prior quarter. Now, with inflation in the March quarter of 6.7%, Yes, a lot of that spending increase was just because we're paying more for stuff, but uh, you can see a real increase uh, over and above that. Now, that's better than the New Zealand average. Certainly, when you look at over the last 12 months, there's been an increase of 12% uh, in card spending, according to market view data. Again, that is the momentum that you're still seeing continue. You've got locals, increasing numbers of locals who are still spending a fair bit of cash. Um, so, you know, the fact that you're getting to nearly $850 million of spending a year uh, really, I think, does reinforce that that uh, increasing trend and the level of, uh, of of interest coming through locally. To the challenges, though, uh, the primary sector is in a more compromised uh, position. That's not through anything we're trying to deliberately do ourselves, if you will. It is just um, the vicious cycle of the global markets. You can see here our estimate for uh, the next uh, payout, or the payout sort of just ended, actually, uh, when it gets finalised. We're thinking it's just a touch below $600 million. It was sort of sitting at, I think, about $680-odd million uh, for the season prior, so um, you're seeing a, a Definitely a bit coming off there, and I guess uh, that's again reflective of that conversation earlier around the likes of the Chinese economy, not as strong uh, levels of purchasing and, and sales prices coming through from the rest of the world. Uh, similar trends are happening in the likes of um, uh, meat markets and, and what have you. The difficulty is, is that you know the payout that you're seeing at the moment is still a healthy level of payout. It's just that you've seen that farm prices have increased, on-farm costs rather, have increased at such a, a rapid rate. Now, I said before that um, the CPI, the Consumer's Price Index, um, you know, what we talk about is general inflation is a good measure if you're a household buying bananas. You'll see here that if you're farm not buying bananas but buying farm stuff, you're paying a heck of a lot more um, with those trends over time. So it, it's, I think, you know, important to recognise that on-farm inflation has moderated slightly to 12% over the last year. 
it's still a massive whack. Uh, and so, again, the, the challenges that are coming forward is that everyone are being hit with those continued cost pressures. Prices or, or you know, what you're earning is not nearly uh, as strong. So there is very much um, a crimping of uh, people's margins emerging. To housing and construction, this is a big one, uh, not only in terms of um, construction being the second largest employer for the district, but increasingly uh, this has much wider economic and social uh, spin-offs. Um, first things first, to, to sort of reiterate that point around interest rates before, we think we're most of the way through those raising uh, cycles, but you'll see as well if you look at the green line for the effective interest rate, that it's going to take a while um, for every household to be on there uh, to, and, and to move through onto those higher uh, mortgage rates. It's probably still about half of the mortgage book, maybe 40% that still have to refix over the next six to nine months. So there are a lot of people out there going, geez, I'm going to have to find some pretty serious cash, uh, but they haven't necessarily had to do it so far. Importantly, though, there's a real distributional difference starting to come through. Um, and, and I think it's important to take in mind, it's not everyone that is going to be hit with these costs, but those that are, are being hit quite significantly. If I think of myself, for example, my uh, as, as a renter down in Wellington, um, I was uh, uh, packed, uh, certainly as an economist, had a bit of a look into the future and thought I'll try and lock in my rent for two years, which my landlord agreed to. I'm not paying anything different for my living costs at the moment as I was two years ago. Uh, my family uh, up home in Whangadei who bought their house Mum and dad would have bought it, gosh, over 20 years ago. Their mortgage is either done or just about done. So they're not affected too much by this. They've paid that mortgage rate before. They've paid it for a long time. My friend in Wellington, though, who bought at the peak of the market uh, in November 2021, they need to find $30,000 more this year to pay their mortgage. Uh, that's a huge amount of money multiplied by all of the recent first home buyers. Uh, $30,000 per person being sucked out of the economy uh, has to come from somewhere. So, again, you start to see those distributional uh, issues that emerge through at the same time, things aren't probably quite as bad. Now, my friend uh, in Wellington with that $30,000 more, if she sold her house today, she'd also need, to, uh, I think, to take a loss of about $300,000, uh, given how much Wellington prices have shifted down. You'll see here that, or, uh, I guess, two important trends. One, Waipa District hasn't seen as much of a decline as the national average over time, down around about 5%. The national average, depending on the measure you're looking at, is sort of more around the 12 to 17 to 20%, because um, there are a few numbers floating about. Importantly as well, though, you'll also note that where you are at the moment is still above where you were at any point before, what's that, like 2021. So if you bought at the peak of the market, yep, not good. You're in negative equity. If you bought any time before that, you're still sweet. You're not as happy because you're not getting the peak price, but let's be fair, that peak price does look pretty silly when you put it on a chart. So again, those nuances, I think, are increasingly important. Now, in our view, these are we don't forecast house prices at a, at a local level. That gets really complicated, but we do do it at a national level. And you can see here our expectations are that we think we are uh, getting closer to a bottom uh, in terms of house prices. And um, we think as well um, that there's also sort of a natural constraint. We don't think the house prices will go up too much from here. Uh, and part of that is because of affordability. I'll show you some numbers on that shortly. Uh, but suffice to say, we think that house prices are probably done a fair amount of their dash. There's almost there's some mathematical elements where they'll uh, look like they keep dropping for a while yet, um, but at the moment the, the, the figures do seem to show a little bit of a change. Uh, again, part of that though is um, I guess we're starting to see a real, or had been seeing a real different dynamic emerging, uh, where you go back to 2021 when my friend bought, um, this was probably her exact example, uh, everyone was going to the bank and three seconds later they were walking out with as many money bags uh, as they could and they walked along to an open home altogether uh, and they threw us all their money bags on the ground and said I'd like to buy your house uh, and the seller took whoever threw the most money bags and if you didn't win then you loaded your money bags back up into the wheelbarrow and you and the other 49 people went to the next house rinse and repeat until you got one um, hopefully uh, now uh, you go along to the bank and after three years they'll eventually let you out after they've gone through every Uber Eats and, and McDonald's order you've ever made um, and you'll have very few money bags because um, you don't you can't service that mortgage and so you walk along to the open home and you go actually it's not an open home it's just sort of a um uh, you know someone showing you through you put your money bags down you say look i've got this many money bags either you take my money bags and we've got a sale or you don't and you're probably not going to sell your house for a wee while and so the seller then has to go well that's less than I thought I'd get before, but no one else has come through that door in the last five days, so maybe I should take the money. And uh, increasingly, those sellers are also having to go, how much do I, do, I, do I need to sell at the moment? If I don't need to sell, should I wait until maybe I can get a better price? I'm not hard up against it. If I don't need the cash right now, maybe I'll sit on it. And so we are still seeing a very low level of sales across the country, um, and that's reflective, I think, of all of those trends, not 
people when they go and now can't get as big of a mortgage because they're being tested at higher and higher interest rates. That's actually good. It's, it's challenging if you're trying to, to get in, but it is good because it means that you aren't going to get turfed out of your home immediately, but it does mean there are very uh, much fewer uh, number of buyers in the market. We're also seeing a shift, uh, two big shifts, I guess, in the construction market more generally. Uh, the first one is that you'll see a massive increase, these are national figures, by the way, uh, in attached dwellings, those sort of medium density options of townhouses. Um, that is, in my mind, here to stay, uh, just in terms of, at the moment, the constraint around housing and similar is still the land price. Um, in fact, I know some areas, uh, when they last got revalued, somehow uh, some of the sort of added value of the house and for some people, house hadn't changed, by the way, actually went, went down, was worth $200,000 last valuation, all of a sudden it was worth $150,000. That was only because the land price had gone up so much that the model couldn't quite work out how to put it up even more. Uh, so had to take some out of the additional value. So land price is still the constraint. If I can get a bit of land and put one standalone house or three townhouses on it, as an economist, you're de definitely going to take the three townhouses because that makes uh, not only more economic sense to you, but also more economic sense to the buyer. You'll also, however, note uh, that sort of pullback in both uh, standalone houses in the dark blue and townhouses uh, in the orange. Now, that's what happens when you've got high building costs, and I'll profile them in a second, but you've also got those house prices pulling back. If you're a developer and you're going, well, look, it's hard to get finance because, again, I can't get as many money bags. Uh, it's kind of co going to cost me 15% more to build this stuff than I thought it was going to. And at the moment, I'm going to take 10 to 15% less than I thought I was originally going to. That's a lot harder to stack up these days than it was before. So you are seeing a natural pullback uh, in consents that's coming through uh, locally. It's coming through uh, across the country. To those construction costs, now these are important not only if you're a developer, but equally if you're a council, uh, if you will, um, councils will be, will be most interested in that dark uh, green line for civil construction, um, that's more around the likes of your transport costs and um, uh, for roads and, and bridges, um, but also water infrastructure. And you'll see that had been at a high level. Now over the last three years, depending on the measure you're looking at, uh, the price of building a road has increased by about 22%, uh, building a bridge by over 30%. Uh, that's more in three years than you saw over like the previous 12 to 24, depending on what you had it on. So those prices have increased significantly. That means that if you're looking to do, uh, do the same CapEx projects as you had in your last long-term plan, you're not going to have enough money and enough resource to do it all. And so increasingly, the advice we are providing through to councils, and I make this pretty freely and frankly available, um, is that you will need to have a much greater level of prioritisation coming through in your capital plans moving forward. If everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority and not everything is going to get done. And that, that means a difficult but important conversation, uh, not only for you, but also with your communities and saying, look, what are the top five priorities that we can do and what are six to ten that we'd like to get to and if we find the time and the money and similar we, we will get to but we actually need to get going with these ones first before we move to the second set. Uh, that also means um, uh, again a careful focus on procurement and, and, and similar uh, because you'll see here that our forecast for civil construction costs uh, remain higher until at least what's that 2026, 27 uh, than at any time uh, in, in the prior sort of in that few years pre-pandemic. So again there is that greater level of cost pressure coming forward. It does mean a greater level of prioritisation. And let's be clear, it means saying no to some stuff. Um, and I think everyone's got to be bold enough to do it. At a household level, you're having to do it. You're buying the food and the rent and everything else and something else has not got to be spent on. Um, those are sort of the difficult decisions that will have to be made uh, going forward. But everyone is having to make them. Locally, you are still seeing a fairly high uh, number of consents um, coming forward, and that's because there had been a big build-up and a huge amount of work uh, to in increase the opportunities coming through locally. Uh, as well as that, you know, you do see that little bit of a pullback in more recent times, um, again, consistent with that expectation that there is going to be a pullback in consents generally. Um, however, you'll also note, I mean, this chart goes back to 2008. Um, you know, even through the likes of 2018 through 2020, you were looking at sort of 600 high excuse me, 600 homes a year. Before that, you had sort of 300. You're now building at 800. Um, so in a sense, the local construction sector is actually unlikely to be building all of those all at once. And so as we go forward, uh, we do expect there is a bit of a lag. To highlight that, um, we don't have a huge amount of 
publicly available information on actual completions of houses, but Auckland Council does thankfully provide us a little bit of data on the Code of Compliance Certificates issued. Now, if you look uh, at this chart, uh, we've got data since 2013 looking at CCCs and then uh, building consents if you lag them two years, just to give you a bit of a feel. At the moment, the gap between CCCs issued and consents issued is about the largest that we've got on record over that uh, decade-long stretch or so. And so it reinforces that, yes, you might well have consents that have jumped up and then might well pull back. Actual levels of building activity won't have gone as high, but also won't pull back nearly as quickly because there is a lot of work, if you will, still to get through. We're also seeing a sustained level uh, of uh, investment in the sort of commercial industrial uh, work. At the same time, that is plateauing off. Still at high levels, 200 million is uh, pretty significant considering where Waipar District's been over time. Uh, but again, that sort of feeling that, look, it's going to be more difficult for businesses to expand. They are getting hit with interest rate increases as well. They're not going to be as willing or able to afford the investments that they might have previously been thinking about. Uh, there has, however, been a significant increase, and you see part of that in the chart there, uh, in the likes of um, industrial uh, investment factories and storage, for example. Uh, people are increasingly looking at the Waikato more generally uh, for those opportunities. They're looking outside of Auckland because of the constraints that Auckland has on it. They're looking at that sort of golden triangle element uh, with you know the likes of the inland uh, port going in um, outside Hamilton uh, with the port opportunities through to Tauranga. So all of this area, I think, is increasingly in focus. The investment that Council's already made in some of those industrial zones and around the airport are important. Um, increasingly, though, there is a lot of talk and a lot of, um, I guess, rising good-natured competition uh, across the region. Um, Waikato District trying to do a lot as well, uh, and increasingly talking to people who are mentioning the likes of South Waikato uh, around Tokoroa. So again, good to see those investments because it's good for the region, um, and obviously Waipa has got a fairly uh, strong amount of that coming through at, this, at the moment and has the infrastructure to be able to resource it, uh, but something I think to be aware of is that rising level of competition starting to emerge. And also there's a heap of infrastructure work uh, to be done. Uh, this is uh, our figures for across the wider region based on um, prior expectations from long-term plans and similar. This is a volume of work measure, so it's not the dollar uh, it's not the dollar amount in terms of um, the, the cost price that you'll pay. It's, it's once we adjust for inflation and similar. Um, you'll see that those levels still remain pretty high until at least sort of 2027 uh, or so. And so again, Strong momentum, good investments that are coming forward, uh, but an ability to necessarily massively upgrade uh, capital uh, outlays is, is definitely uh, unlikely to be on the cards or difficult to achieve at the very least. Um, and like I said, with that as well, I guess just a profile where we're seeing consents heading. Uh, more generally, we're seeing that consents nationally will head from their 51,000 peak down to around sort of 30,000 by 2026, 27. That's still a very strong number. Uh, it's just that it is very much pulling back from those higher levels. Uh, the construction industry generally seems to think that about 40,000, maybe a little bit higher than that, is roughly where they can build. So there's still a good 10,000 out the other side that sort of need to be built in the next year or two anyway that are sort of left over from recent times. So then to housing affordability, and I know that um, Council will be talking about this like everyone else uh, does over time. I guess I um, just wanted to run through a few things. Um, uh, we're, we're, I'm having a conversation uh, with staff at the moment around some of these elements, but I guess um, suffice to say that it depends a little bit on the measure as to uh, how you think about affordability at the moment. Um, you'll see here both the National and the WIPA figure in 2023 seeing an improvement in housing affordability on the median multiple measure. Um, if you manage to save up uh, what is that sort of six and a half incomes and spent nothing for six and a half years um, as a household, yeah, you could you could buy a house at the moment and it would be slightly cheaper than if you saved up seven lots of your income without spending anything ever for seven years. Uh, funnily enough, no one does that uh, because you've got to live and you've got to pay. So although on this measure, you're seeing affordability might well be improving. Uh, if you look at how much you're paying for a mortgage repayment, which is a much, if you will, more practical or realistic outcome, uh, things are getting decidedly worse. At the moment, the national average is sitting around 50% of your average household income to repay a mortgage. Uh, y power is slightly better than that, but certainly trending in the same direction. Um, and in fact, at the moment, the numbers are near to the worst on record. Now, that's nothing, uh, like I say, specific to Y power. It is just a general trend across uh, the country. But I think worthwhile profiling that, yes, although house prices are coming down, the fact that you're paying more on the mortgage repayment means uh, that's quite uncomfortable. To highlight as well, um, this, uh, these are some of probably the worst uh, affordability times for New Zealand housing ever. Um, and I know that someone will say, oh, but what about 87 when interest rates are at 20%? Um, 
which was my grandfather's favourite refrain. Um, we did the numbers. Uh, back in 1987, if you were paying that 20% mortgage, uh, you were spending 48% of your average household income on your first year mortgage repayment. Uh, back last year, you were spending 49. Now you're spending about 50%. Uh, so this is is very much a, a live challenge, um, if you will. And then I, I guess lastly is also looking at the rental profile. Um, and again, similar profile in why part of the rest of New Zealand, uh, there has been an increase in the amount of money or the proportion of your household of income that you'll have to pay to pay the mortgage, uh, sorry, to pay your rent payments uh, each and every week. Uh, again, not necessarily particularly different to the uh, the national average, a bit more uh, pressure coming forward uh, locally, and that's just because more people have been calling the area home. But I guess important to reinforce that if you are able to focus on affordability, uh, that will be increasingly important, not only to attract people to your area, but increasingly to ensure that people have enough money to pay for everything else in life too. All right, we're getting towards the end. Don't worry, I, I know the energy levels are slipping as I tell you about the doom and gloom of affordability. Um, so then to the labour market, um, because at the end of the day, the economy is just uh, very much about people. Again, um, strong numbers and strong momentum coming through locally, uh, around about 29, just under 29,000 people uh, locally who are employed. So some of the figures I showed you earlier around employment were based on where people work, not necessarily where they live. This is looking at people who live in Waipa District. We don't necessarily know where they work. They might well work in other parts of the region. Uh, but again, a lot of the time they're going to spend their money here locally and, and contribute to the local economy as well. Those numbers have been growing strongly, up 3.1%. Now, that's about double the uh, national average growth rate. So again, uh, that momentum is strong and continues, um, even despite the sort of challenges in the economy at the moment. Uh, how, where has that come from over time? Um, there's been about 750, I think, more jobs in Waipa than a year ago. Uh, the greatest focus there coming from accommodation and food services. That's natural as the tourism economy starts to, to move forward again. Uh, a healthy increase in the likes of education and health as well, um, as there's a continued focus there from government, uh, but also higher levels of the likes of manufacturing and retail trade as well. Towards the other end of the spectrum, um, two of the larger parts of the employment market seeing a bit of a decline, but again, we've canvassed uh, some of those already. Uh, that slight uh, pullback in construction, but also high costs in construction means there has been a little bit of a shift downwards, uh, and the primary sector as well has started to see a bit of a decline. Uh, that primary sector decline is true not only here, but across the country. It's not a you guys thing. It is very much uh, that the primary sector is under some constraints, not only because of the cost pressures, but also because they haven't been able to find as many staff compared to a lot of other industries. There's been more sort of inter-industry competition for people over time. I guess what's uh, probably interesting, if we look at this and we look at the previous two slides of that sort of continued level of employment growth coming forward, and we've seen that again across the country, uh, you know, the latest jobs numbers out the other day for the month of June nationally were up 0.4% month on month, uh, and service employment has grown at its fastest pace in 15 years, which feels pretty weird when like we're supposed to be in a recession and, you know, the economy is supposed to be pulling back, yet people are hiring a lot more. What's interesting is you take all of that and you also take uh, businesses' expectations of where employment is likely to go and businesses at the moment are saying, well, we're not putting as many jobs out there. The number of job ads out there on offer has uh, come back, pulled back to sort of more pre-pandemic levels. And I think what that highlights is that a lot of the employment growth we've been seeing recently has sort of been filling in the jobs that businesses would have liked to have filled at the end of last year but couldn't because they couldn't get people. Migration has now come forward. There's more people available. They're able to fill those jobs. But they're also saying, look, if the next few months are going to be challenging, maybe I'm not going to hire as many people. Maybe I'll be a bit more restrained because I want to go into these tougher economic times sort of right size rather than too large. And so increasingly, we have it getting that feeling that yes, there is momentum at the moment, but across the country, that's likely to pull back uh, at some point over the next six months. Locally, uh, in terms of job ad numbers for the or regionally at least, uh, because we can only get these at a regional level, uh, Waikato job ads have declined about 6% so far in 2023. You'll still see that relative to New Zealand, they are a fair way uh, above. And again, I think encouraging to see that level of momentum. It reinforces the employment trends we've seen in some of the other charts. Uh, but again, moving in that similar position where people are not quite as gung-ho around employment as they had been previously. We think that wages remain fairly high for a while. Part of that is uh, those pricing pressures on wages have to work their way through the system. Um, you know, there will be a number of places where uh, they've agreed 
during the peak of inflation uh, that you know they were going to have an increase in their business of this much this year, and then a fair bit more in year two, and then a bit more again in year three. So some of those are already or uh, baked into the numbers, if you will, but but won't appear um, formally for a little while yet. Uh, but you can see we still sort of have it until 24, 25 before those paces moderate a bit more. Feels a bit unusual given I'm saying that we think employment's going to pull back a bit. I guess the the reason there is that I don't I genuinely don't think that this recession, this pullback in jobs is necessarily going to have to require a lot of people to lose their jobs. I think instead what you're likely to see is a lot more people are looking for jobs and all of a sudden not as many jobs become available. Those people will become unemployed, but they haven't left a job. They haven't been kicked out. They just have, haven't been able to find one. To give you an example of that, at the end of last year, we saw a 17% increase in the number of people who didn't have a job, who didn't previously want a job, but all of a sudden, they'd probably take a job if you gave it to them. And I think that was indicative of a few things. One, yes, you've got that high level of migration coming forward, but also increasingly, you've got high levels of um, inflation, which means if you're a household going, stuff's expensive, maybe I need to go and work or work a little bit more when I didn't previously. And also, wage rates look pretty attractive. Hey, I'll actually get paid a fair bit if I go and work now, so maybe it's more attractive than before. So that's dragging more people in, and as you drag more people in, we do think that that wage pressure starts to slacken back, but we don't necessarily think that means people that have to get fired. To put that in context as well around that unemployment rate, at the moment we're at 3.4%. Um, that's still unusually low. 4% was like normal low previously. So we have to get back to 4% unemployment nationally before we think we're even at normal tightness. And we think it then goes up to around 5 maybe just a little bit above 5% after that. Now, that's certainly not a good thing, and I don't want to imply that it's something that we're gleefully, as economists, thinking about. But uh, what it really does highlight is that we are looking to have a little bit more slack in the labour market. And importantly as well, if you look at that over time, um, it could also be a lot worse. That sort of level of unemployment around 5% is more around where we were sort of 2015 or so, which, again, we can always and should always aspire to do better. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves that this is sort of economic cataclysmic uh, outcomes, that it's sort of a feeling that we had gone from extremely tight. Now we probably are going to revert back a little bit too much the other way to unlock the economy a little bit more before we try and move into a more sustainable pathway. Just to conclude, uh, though, and, and I guess this is the longer term look, is that, um, yes, the last few years have been difficult. Yes, uh, COVID's been a huge upheaval, so has inflation, so have higher interest rates. We do know, though, that some of those wider term changes uh, that had appeared and were on the radar before COVID got put on the back burner over the last few years, they are now very much coming back to the fore. The likes of climate change and similar uh, is emerging. It's encouraging to see that our emissions continue to, to profile down, uh, but at the same time, a lot more work to do. On the workforce front, as you can see here, we are going to have a real challenge uh, in the next 30 years or so around the workforce. And if we're not already, already using ChatGPT to write uh, everything for us, we're probably soon going to have to. You'll see here, uh, nationally at least, uh, the number of over 65-year-olds has increased 3% um, over the last year. Uh, you've seen a big uptick uh, because of migration in the 15 to 64, the working age population. But you'll see at the up-and-comers, the 15 under-15s group is... Uh, ever so slightly positive all of a sudden, uh, but has been pretty lacklustre over time. That means that you're increasingly going to have a lot of older people that are moving out of the workforce at some point or working less, and a lot fewer people coming in to replace them. In some parts of the country, there are three times as many people expected to hit retirement age in the next decade as there will be people coming to fill their roles. We're going to have to work smarter, not harder, because we won't have as many people to do the work we're currently doing, let alone thinking about growth. So I guess um, that focus there is thinking about um, the future of the local area, the future of the country, the future of how uh, you do work. It is going to have to change. Um, either that or you're all going to have to learn how to do three times as much work a day. And knowing what the work elected members and staff do, uh, you're lucky to get a few hours sleep at the best of times, let alone doing even more. So recognising those future challenges, um, yes, it's difficult, and, and yes, there are some, some huge uh, challenges uh, that are coming forward, but I think also an opportunity now to recognise that, to plan for the future, to integrate those sort of changes uh, through into business practice because it's very much coming. Uh, and uh, if there's one thing that we can't avoid, uh, taxes and deaths uh, and, and ageing seem to be uh, a few of them. With that, I'll stop for a second, take a breath. Uh, I'll turn the fire hose off uh, and more than happy to take any and all of your questions. Lovely. Thank you, Brad. That was very enlightening. Uh, so I'll open the floor um, for any questions. Start with you, Monty. Uh, thanks, Brad. I've got, I've got two questions. Um, first, it was, um, we're running the biggest current account deficit since the oil shocks, at which time we didn't have a floating dollar. 
now we do. Would you be expecting to see some pressure on the dollar as a result of that going forward? To a degree. Um, I mean, one of the other things that we're looking at alongside the, the pressure on the dollar is, um, and we saw this after the uh, Christchurch earthquakes, is that at some point we need to bring in a whole lot of uh, insurance money to get us out of um, the hole that the Auckland floods and, and Cyclone Gabriel provided. Now, that much demand for New Zealand dollars all at once, we saw it during Christchurch, we'll see it again at some point, is likely to put a bit more pressure on the dollar. Um, I guess, though, the, the bigger issue at the moment is more around how New Zealand's interest rates are likely to trend with the rest of the world. New Zealand thinks we're done. Uh, the Aussies have paused for a bit, uh, but the Americans look like they're still going to go up even further. So I think that could put a little bit more pressure on, on the currency at the moment. But to be fair, we're sort of a little bit beholden um, to what happens internationally. I mean, we've tried before to control the currency and you just end up burning a whole lot of money while a much bigger economy than you sort of just laughs, sneezes and changes it around anyway. So it's sort of a, it's a difficult one, that one. All right, well, if this is not a, um, a test, I think we'll be evacuating everybody. Maybe I should turn the fire hose back on. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, everybody, uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you for um, accommodating that evacuation. I think we all did pretty well, actually. All in uh, nice order, no one panicked. So I think that uh, that worked out pretty well. Uh, we will just await Councillor Gordon to come back online, but we'll make a start. Um, so you're just acknowledging that he will be online, um, hopefully very shortly. Uh, so if anyone has any questions uh, for Brad, I think we can probably take those on you know, um, ad hoc a little bit later. Um, just feed them through to Kirsty if that's okay. And we will circulate his presentation. All right, so what we'll do now is we will uh, uh, sort of formally open our uh, strategic planning and policy committee meeting today, the 1st of August. Uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to ask our Māori Ward Councillor, Dale Murray, to uh, offer karakia. I think after having that quick exit out the building, I'm going to do <coughs> it. Usually, most of my uh, karakia will be non denominational. So, Takari mai teata, ura teata, kake teata, uru mai te ao, uru mai te ao, te tangata, kiana reringa, kitona kawa, tenei te ao, hea marma, irungo whakairia, huie, taiki. Tina koe tau. Tina koe, thank you. All right, uh, moving through our agenda, so we'll uh, call for apologies. We just have um, Mayor Susan just away for a few minutes, so we'll just put a, a short uh, a short note uh, regarding that. Are there any disclosure of members' interests this morning? Nothing? Any late items? No. Uh, then we'll move to the confirmation of the order of the meeting. And thank you, Claire, and thank you, Andrew. All in favour? Carried. Thank you, everyone. Now, moving into our minutes, we've got our minutes from the 30th of May. Uh, can I have a, a move and a second to please that uh, those are correct? Yep. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Andrew. All in favour? Aye. Um, yep. And we're moving on to the next set of minutes to approve, which is the 6th of June. I have a move and a second to please that they are a true and accurate record. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Mike. All in favour? carried. We've also got the 19th of June, which of course was our Sainsbury Road hearing. Uh, so I'd like to ask for a move and a seconder, please, for the, the accuracy of those minutes. So thank you, Lou. Thank you, Claire. All in favour? Um, Lou wasn't there? No, no. Okay, Lou will not be moving it. So um, <laughs> Bruce will move that and Andrew will second it. All in favour? No. Carried. Thank you, everybody. All right, we'll move on to our first um, item, which is the uh, long-term plans, and we have Melissa and Anthea here. I'll hand over to you. Morning, everyone. Uh, so I will take uh, my LTP report as read, but just note that the project is progressing well. A um, couple of things I'd like to highlight is that work's progressing on the policies and strategies that underpin the long-term plan, including the financial and infrastructure strategies and funding financial policies. Uh, we have a number of workshops with you in September and October to go through uh, first drafts of those with you. Uh, managers are currently working on business cases and the prioritisation of capital projects and the first draft of the capital budget and those projects will be brought back to you at a workshop on the 22nd of August. And finally, the levels of service information that elected members requested at a workshop we had in June with you will be brought back over the next few weeks as well. So. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has on the project. Lovely, thank you for that update. Uh, Claire. Yes, um, thank you. Um, it looks really good and I like the way that you've got the status and all that kind of thing, which is really helpful. Um, my question is about the infrastructure strategy um, number eight. Uh, just in the media this week, um, Ross Copland, the um, CEO of New Zealand Infrastructure Commission, was quoted that councils need a, a laser sharp focus on understanding and maximising the utility that we get from our existing infrastructure networks and looking after them so they realise their full asset lives. And um, another guidance he gave was that for every $40 we spend on new infrastructure, we should be investing $60 in maintenance and renewals. I'm just wondering whether or not uh, that kind of practice is already used in WIPA or whether or not there's going to be an added focus on that during the development of the infrastructure strategy. Good question. 
Melissa, do you know? <laughs> but too technical for me. But I'll refer to it is quite. Question. It is quite technical. Uh, and no, sorry, I do not have the answer for that. Um, but I can take that question away. Um, uh, I would just like to note, though, um, the infrastructure strategy. We'll be having a workshop on that coming up. Another workshop on that coming up. Um, so I'll um, aim to bring that information back to you at that workshop. 26th of September workshop. Okay, thank you, staff. Um, any other questions? Andrew, go. You want to. I can see you want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually, just following on from what Claire has said, um, I would be very pleased to bring you bring that back to the workshop um, because it does it does seem to me in terms of um, our buildings that there has been possibly a lack of maintenance over the years that has resulted in um, us incurring effectively more costs overall and, and it's look it's it's also a matter of identifying what's important. Um, you know, prioritising those that are, have ongoing use and those that don't and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, we've got a recommendation on page 22 of our report. Uh, would someone like to receive the report? Thank you, Marcus. You'll move it and Mike will second it. All in favour? Aye. Carried. Thank you, ladies. All right, we'll move on to our next item, which is our draft dangerous affected and sanitary buildings policy for consultation. We have Graham Pollard. Good morning, Graham. Good morning. So now I can use the microphone. Right, good morning. Um, this is a report to seek the committee's um, adoption of the draft dangerous affected and insanitary buildings policy and statement of proposal. The policy as has previously been mentioned, um, the policy itself hasn't actually changed, but the draft is in that we're adding more procedural detail for clarity for the reader. Um, in the report, we are talking of um, consulting in August and September. Now, uh, I understand that we are in the process of trying to purchase um, some software for the handling and the managing of submissions um, with a view to using this as part of the long-term plan work next year. Um, as such, we would like to actually try this on a smaller project than the long-term plan and um, been identified that this is a, a possible candidate for trialing the new software as we don't have it to begin the consultation um, next week would be somewhat pre premature so we're asking if the committee could actually um, approve an amendment to recommendation c there that we consult before the end of this calendar year 2023 rather than tie ourselves down to the August to September date so we can use this software and give it a go. Thank you, Graham. I think that I'm seeing some nodding around the table. I think that's acceptable. So, Thank you. All right, so we'll take the report as read in general. Um, so are there any questions around? Claire. Thanks. Yeah, I've got a few questions. In fact, Graham, I've been a bit remiss. I should send through my little notes that there are a few things there. My biggest question was that in the definition of housing, it specifically excludes hostels. And I was thinking about, you know, we've had the Loafers Lodge fire um, in Wellington earlier this year, and councils did come under a little bit of criticism because you know, they, they, there was a question as whether or not they had been inspected for safety and all that kind of thing. So here we have a policy for dangerous and sanitary buildings and such, and yet it specifically excludes hostels. Yeah, I just wanted to understand that a bit more. Like, was that a deli uh, you You're basing it on a previous policy? We're basing you know, it on the yeah. existing policy, yes. I'm just wondering, have we got any of our technical experts here. Um, Carl, Wayne, possibly anything to add on this one, please? Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a look at that. Um, yeah. Just check the legislative requirement. 
obviously, and certainly in light of the recent um, mm. events relating to boiling um, hostile fires. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, um, Greg, if you could just repeat just for um, anyone online just what Wayne said. Okay, yeah. um, that we'll look into that uh, that uh, further. We'll look at legislative uh, requirements and so on um, around hostels and and that and that kind of building yeah. use as well. Yeah, no, thanks okay. for that. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, and um, and just another question on the same definitions part. In this time, heritage building, um, and I can give you the page number. That's page fifty-eight of our report. Um, and the, the household unit is sort of below there where the hostel thing came up. But in heritage buildings, the definition is that it's, um, you know, on the list maintained by Heritage New Zealand or it is a national historic landmark. Would there be heritage buildings that we would consider a heritage in Waipa that might only be perhaps on the district plan that aren't, so they wouldn't actually fall within this definition? Are we sure that everything that we've got that we've identified as, as a heritage building would also be on those two lists? Again, we can double check with the yeah. district plan as to whether there is anything. Yeah. Um, um, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll amend that as necessary. If, if we've got lots of amendments um, that we we'll, may need to bring this back just prior to going out for consultation when we've decided that just to make absolutely certain but if if it's if it's if it's minor amendments we probably wouldn't need to but i, I can always respond to these questions through through um uh, through uh, the uh, council's communication channels mm. okay none of that look that sounds fine graham honestly um yes, yeah so, so i'll just send through my annotations okay. to you yeah, thank you i think it's thank great you. to catch those things now yeah. you know well, it's, let's make sure going out with the right yeah. document absolutely yeah. thank mm. you okay susan yeah, well, this is a bit fandango, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> yeah, just, just quickly, and it's nothing specific about your report, but it's more about a structure issue, I suppose, isn't it? I'm trying to understand under seven, uh, paragraphs or section seven, which is on page 30, a lot of our, you know, where you've listed other considerations, a number of our reports have an extra heading of iwi and uh, mana whenua consideration, and I notice this one doesn't, as do quite a few through this agenda. So um, I'm not sure what the what the uh, requirement is in terms of and why it is or isn't in there, but I'm, I'm, my sense is it probably should be, even if it's there's nothing um, substantive to say, at least it's being considered um, in reference to the, the particular report. Um, it's probably a, a practice that I think, I think we had developed in terms somehow seems to have dropped off this and some of the other reports. So if we can just... Um, a bit more um, diligent, I guess, at ensuring that the, that that consideration is listed and, and um, addressed. That would be good. Okay. Okay. Cool. That's noted. Mike. Um, just, I, I thought um, Councillor St. Pierre's points there were really, really excellent. Do we have time to carry on through the list, or not? Absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, have you got more, Claire? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have actually. I mean, they're really substantive points. They're not just minor oh, drafting yes. points. Um, yes, I do have more points, Mike, but those are the most substantive ones. The other ones were things like um, earlier in the in the policy, it talks about council will get expert advice, okay, but it's it's not really clear whether or not the the building owner will actually have to pay for that advice. It'd be good to it, it does sort of cover sort of later on in the policy that costs will be recovered from the um, property owner if, if possible. But I think um, I felt there was sort of a bit of murkiness or, or fuzziness around where you could get free advice and where you might actually end up, you know, trying to help this person with the building, but actually you're going to be racking up quite a few costs for them, which might, yeah, um, just how those costs would be um, managed so that, you know, the, the cost to the to the property owner would be minimised. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll look into those again and clarify. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then one other question I did have, I guess, on the definitions again, and this is on page, just trying to get it, page 56, what the definition of a building is. It mentions some other structures, but I, I wondered whether or not it could also be a dam. 
and um, yeah, so it doesn't. It talks about the structures that might be permanent or immovable, and they talk about intended for occupation. Okay, but a dam wouldn't be intended for occupation. Yeah. So again, whether or not are we talking about structures generally? or only structures that are likely to be inhabited by people, animals, yeah, chattels, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Again, I'll... Yeah, and I've got that in my I'll consult with yeah. The, yeah. Um, the technical experts on this one, and yeah. Um, yeah. I, can, I can feed all the information back yeah. to you, yeah. just to make doubly sure we've answered off the concerns. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. If you can look into all of those. Are there any other yeah. queries, uh, questions for Graham on this item? Okay. No other questions? No other, no other queries? Okay. Hey, we're going to, I think, um, look to make some changes to the, to the current recommendations. I think given... Um, there are a number of changes to be made. Let's not adopt this to go out for consultation. Let's uh, bring this back to this uh, this committee um, just so that we can uh, ensure that we have everything um, in order uh, and that we're going out with a really good uh, document to our communities. So if, is, any, is everyone in agreement with that? Yeah, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to give Joe just some time to um, change the uh, recommendation that's in front of us. Uh, so we'll give her a couple of minutes to do that. I think we'll just take a, a, a one minute breather. We're, we're ahead of time. And, uh, and that, query that Susan raised, but... Okay, and, uh, and Kirsty has something that she would like to catch up with everyone on. <laughs> um, so just through you, Madam Chair, in response to Mayor Susan's feedback about the report template and mana whenua iwi considerations, there are two sections of the report template that one and also one relating to climate change, that if they're not directly applicable, um, the template provides for the removal of those. So we will look at changing the template um, so that there is some specific reference. If, if it's not applicable, it is at least referred to within the template. Yeah, look, I think that's really important. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsty. Yeah, because we can move on to another one. It's going to be shown. I am sorry, she said. She's almost done. That's right. We'll just take a break. It's easier than yeah, flicking yeah. through everything yeah. like that. So, and I'd like to know. I'd like to know where Councillor Gordon is. Is it if he's online or not? Oh, yeah. I think I feel it's like, yeah. Okay. And so, do we have to put an apology in for him now? Mm -hmm. um, apology. His internet is really bad. He said as well. It's too late for an apology, isn't it? Oh, look, it was a bit messy, I agree, but um, it is what it is. No, he has not. No, he was not the email. Yeah. Okay, everyone, so we've got um, an, a new recommendation, A and B, that's up on the screen. So if you just want to take a moment to have a read of that and make sure that you're happy with it. Graham is happy with it. It does mean another report, but hey. <laughs> All right. Okay, right. if everyone... Um, if you've, if I, have I given you enough time to read it? Yes? Okay. So in that case, um, I'd like to move on a second, please, that uh, change of recommendation A and B now. So I've got Claire moving it. I've got Marcus seconding it. Um, all in favour? Right. Carried. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.
Um, okay. okay, everybody, we'll move on to our next item, which is our uh, district growth quarterly report. So I'd like to welcome Wayne. <laughs> And Kirsty. <laughs> All right, I'll hand it over to you both. All right. Is that good? Okay, good morning, um, everybody. And this is the uh, quarterly update for uh, the District Growth Quarter Report, 1st of April through 30 June. Um, it's also the final quarter for 22-23. So uh, as usual, I'll get Kirsty just to take us through the um, first section uh, three on the national, regional and district strategic planning issues. Thank you, Wayne. So through you, Madam Chair, um, I'm just going to provide a brief overview of some key points um, that will be available, um, supported by David Topman to respond to any questions that elected members may have. Um, the first item at a national level, you'll see there that one submission has been lodged um, back at the beginning of July. So whilst elected members were on um, a midwinter break, um, and that was submitted in respect of the Water Services Entities Amendment Bill under delegated authority that is provided for you in Appendix 7 um, to the report. Um, I'd just like to highlight that in respect of matters um, relating to the Future Proof Partnership, those matters are moving and changing at pace and um, we want to ensure that all elected members um, have an overview as to what is happening across the various work streams, whether that's at a governance level, um, technical staff level um, and or um, and at working group level. Um, so rather than um, provide formal reporting, and that still will happen, we are going to provide you with a memorandum on a monthly basis, providing an update um, with access to agendas and minutes that um, will be of interest to you. Um, in respect of the commentary within this report, there is reference to the updating of the Future Proof Strategy um, with the Future um, Development Strategy. That work is well underway and progressing. However, as I just mentioned, things change at pace. And whilst this report references public notification in October 2023, there has been some delay to this work program. Um, there are some delays in terms of technical input from external parties to the future development strategy. That means that public notification is likely to now happen at the beginning of the calendar year 2024, and with formal consultation being undertaken in February through to April 2024. That, of course, is at the same time as we're notifying and consulting on our long-term plan, and the FDS does feed into the long-term plan. Um, the, the team um, in our Future Proof um, umbrella are very much aware of that um, and alive to that. We do have representation as part of a working group. There is now a long-term plan working group that's been established and Anthea um, is representing WIPA on that. Um, fortunately for us also, um, the Communications and Engagement Advisor for Future Proof in the FDS is also um, Natalie Haysom, who is the comms and engagement lead for us in respect of the long-term plan. So I just wanted to focus in on that particular point and make you aware of that. Um, as I said, happy to respond to questions on any other matters within that section. Thank you. Just uh, on an uh, additional point in that section, of course, we've got the resource management reforms um, going on there as well, and uh, the natural and built environment bill and the spatial planning bill. So. Committee's recommended the bills for passing with amendments. Um, we'll bring a workshop back to the committee um, regarding the outcomes of that, um, just for an update of where that um, piece of uh, legislation is tracking. Uh, just moving on in terms of uh, other matters, so page 70 of the agenda relating to district plan change updates. Um, just so notably in there, no, plan, plan change 17, um, that's the decision on, on how to your industrial zones. Um, the, the hearing's completed on that. A number of you are involved with that um, hearings process. Uh, the decision is currently in, uh, being drafted and we're looking to release that uh, next week. Um, and the plan change 20, the airport northern precinct extension uh, plan change, that decision was released on the 23rd June and the appeal period closes on 4 August. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether we get an appeal on, on that one. 
Uh, turning to plan, uh, page 74 on your agenda in terms of resource consents, um, uh, the, the key things here, we, we didn't have any uh, resource consent hearings during this period. Um, I do note that in um, relation to the Environment Court appeals, um, we have still the appeal by NNV, uh, NNV Jennings in relation to the appeal relating to the application to establish artificial structures and shelter belt planning for a kiwi fruit orchard on Parallel Road, Cambridge. Um, so uh, there has been discussions going on between the applicant and um, the appellant, Mr Jennings. I understand no resolution and therefore the matter will proceed um, to uh, mediation process uh, assisted by environment court mediator if there's still no resolution then it will go on to a formal hearing process uh, we will be getting involved from a council perspective at a mediation process uh, just moving on uh, in terms of uh, other matters and the consents um, processed uh, area just in some of the statistics there um, the uh, land use consents in the quarter four, we had 52 in subdivision 32, so we had 84 applications processed, one more than the quarter three of last um, previous year, uh, last quarter, quarter three. And LIMS, uh, again, we had an increase, um, 237 over 223 um, the previous quarter. Uh, in page 76 um, of the agenda, there's uh, information there about the infrastructural development updates on the growth cells. Um, I'll just let you read that. Uh, page 77, we talk uh, a bit about the development contributions that um, uh, have been um, we've received. Um, we issued in the last quarter 49 development contribution notices, um, and uh, we and that was for an amount of 2.1 million, um, and we recovered 5.2 uh, million. So um, overall 22, 23, um, we issued 208 DCs, um, the amount of 25.7 million, and we recovered uh, 8.7 million. So that's actually more than the previous financial year of um, 4.9 million. So we've had an increase there. So we still got um, uh, 56.4 million DCs outstanding. Thank you um, for that, Wayne. I think Claire has a question. Yeah, yeah um, thanks, Wayne. I've got a few questions um, about DCs. Um, the first one is um, the the first part of the report is oh, on page 77. It talks about preparing to do a review of the policy as part of the LTP process. Will that review consider putting in inclusionary zoning requirements? Like, is that... Yeah. Uh, within the ambit of a DC policy? Yeah, yeah I, I didn't get onto that point, but uh, yeah, the, I, we certainly, um, as I was going to say, the development contributions policy is probably highlighted in the previous report to you that it is scheduled for review um, for this financial year. So we'll be commencing that review as part of the LTP process considerations. And um, as you'll see in a subsequent report on this agenda, inclusionary zoning is a matter for our district plan um, considerations. Mm. And you're quite a quite a valid point in relation to the considerations of inclusionary zoning in a development in a DCP and how that fits in. So we'll certainly need to be looking at that quite closely. Yeah. So I attended the um, Waikato Housing Initiative meeting. Um, I think it was the 13th of July, and um, the message I got there was that each district council is is really expected to work with developers and with their policies to um, work out how to how to get mechanisms to sort of um, ensure that there is, you know, those those lower price point buildings or houses being built year and using, I suppose, that relationship with developers to to uh, achieve that year. And I, I guess that's why I thought um, I'm hoping that that's going to be part. And, and, and then I, I, I did see that later agenda item about yeah. that. that district plan change that's coming through as well. Just, yeah. just one point on that is um, generally I would anticipate that the contribution will be a financial contribution, not a development contribution for, a, for an right. inclusionary zoning. So it may well be an RMA charge rather than through the LGA process. Yeah, but, but I'm really pleased that it will be part of the review because we do need to get our development community sort of having input into, you know, how it's going to work for them and what, what they would find, um, yeah, the best approach uh, rather than 
us just putting it in and then getting a lot of pushback. Yeah, okay, that's mm -hmm. good. That's my first yep. question. Um, my second question is um, with the, the, the pie charts or the charts about the development contributions being collected, I note in the non-urban ones on page 79 that, that Titanium Park isn't mentioned. Is that deliberate? Because I would imagine that Titanium Park would be getting some quite substantial DCs. That's all. Yeah. And then you, my last, mm. yeah, you're not too sure? You know. Well, I think the DCs are built in to the, um, already built in. And, oh, okay. And I don't know whether there are any DCs charged for the, because uh, wastewater is, is um, yeah, that's, that's trucked off separately. Yeah. Water comes through um, Pukirumo. Right. Yeah. Um, so, the other ones, I think there may be will be an agreement there with council and the airport authority, and I'm not sure there's DCs oh, okay. applied, but I'd yeah. have to check that with Tony. Okay, all right. Yeah. And then, then the last um, question or comment was around um, on page 78, the top, those circles that talk about DC notices, notices issued, what the charge was, what's collected, and all that kind of thing. It'd be really helpful to have the age of, of the DCs that are outstanding or something because in, in your report you pointed out that we've actually collected more than we've billed for and that's because you know you've got a bit of a tail with um, previous years and mm -hmm. I guess that is probably the biggest concern of councillors that we're actually collecting them and that it's not so much what's issued this year but the fact that you know we've had historical um, DCs that yeah, I guess uh, a due, and we don't know whether or not they're actually being collected. Yeah, I, I guess not that they won't be collected, but the time it's taking to get them in, I guess. All right, yeah. we'll, have, we'll have a look at that. There's another, <laughs> Sorry, another piece of information. This report gets bigger and bigger, but <laughs> um, there might be another chart on that one. But yeah, absolutely, we can have a look at the historic um, amounts of DCs. They'll, they'll generally only go back, I'd imagine, when you know, we started collecting development contributions. Um, previously, it was all financial contribution regime. So we'll have a look at that. Yep. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that there might be a little function in that um, computer program and just had to press the button. <laughs> I don't want yeah. to add significantly to staff's work. But <laughs> all right. Unless there's any questions on that, I'll just carry on. Moving. Yep. Good. Uh, yeah. So... I think we've covered off the development contributions now. So just turning to building compliance, um, pages 79, 80, 81 um, in the agenda. Um, so I guess the key points here is um, we've had a decrease um, in the number of building consents, around 81 issued compared to the same period last year. We've had a decrease in the number of CCCs issued, 16 compared to the same period last year. We've had a decrease in the number of new dwellings issued compared to the same period last year, around 55. Um, and we've generally had a 31% decline in building scene applications for 22, 23 full year compared to the same the two previous full year comparisons of 2021, 21, 22. So it gives you a bit of a stare that there has been a, a decrease. Uh, but in saying that, um, the inspection numbers actually when I was looking at a report for um, that we're preparing for IANS um, who are coming uh, to do a uh, the yearly the two yearly audit on us, um, the number of inspections have actually have increased um, over the 22-23 period to compared to the previous year. Um, we've had 6,176 inspections done over the 22-23 period compared to 5,614. But I guess that's a result of the retirement villages that we're getting as well. So we're getting a lot of inspections in that space. Um, and it was heartening to see in terms of our processing, uh, meeting the 20%, uh, 20 working day compliance, that um, for that 22-23 period, we had 99.84% compliance. So we only actually had three applications over and that compared to the previous year of 99.1, which we had 16 over. So generally really high um, compliance rate in terms of meeting those um, timeframes. Um, yeah, and, and we've got irons turning up in September uh, of, this, of this year, and they'll be doing an audit of us uh, to ensure that we are uh, maintaining our um, appropriate systems and processes um, to achieve the uh, building Act requirements. So we'll report back um, on the outcomes of that, particularly to the Audit and Risk Committee as that comes through. 
Uh, turning to monitoring enforcement, page 81, um, I just take the information on monitoring enforcement as read. Um, highlights, um, we received 133 complaints, um, including 34 littering, 91 parking, and we've issued five uh, Frenchman issues, uh, notices for littering and 187 for parking. So it's quite a considerable increase here in the parking um, infringements. Animal control, um, I did ask Carl for an update on our registration rate for um, dogs. And at the moment we're at 88%, um, about 8,327. The penalty applies at uh, the end of this week, uh, whereas a 50% um, on the base charge will be applied as a penalty if um, people haven't paid. Um, of course, we have the dog policy and the bylaw review underway. And um, as you know, we've got around 276 submissions. So you've got hearings coming up on that. Um, it's probably that. And environmental health, uh, page 83, local alcohol policy review coming up. Um, so there'll be some information coming through to you on that. Mm -hmm. Control purchase operations. Um, interesting, with the police um, conduct control purchase operations to detect whether premises are selling to minors, um, alcohol to minors, and they've done their, they've done two um, CPOs for this financial year. The first one in quarter one, they visited 38 premises. There was one breach, and in quarter four, so just the last um, quarter, they did 42 premises. For, uh, and two breaches. So I understand the two breaches are at the field days. Um, so overall, we've done 80, or the police have done 80 um, CPO uh, inspections and found three breaches. So, uh, which is really not too bad, really, I, I think, um, on that. Yeah, thank you, Sir Chair. Um, sort of re related to that last one. Um, around the breaches around the alcohol is there any way you know, inspectors could work with the police to to do some um some checks on the vape stores i know it's outside of a scape scope here but it's really trying to find any triggers or levers in terms of the possibility of sending in possibly you know like the cops do underage underage people for the for the liquor stores underage people for the vaping stores and actually try and get some traction on getting some fines issued here yeah, look, I know that's a pertinent point that the um, the council has raised previously. I think we'll do a bit of work in that space and we'll bring a report back to the committee. Yeah, look, it would be really nice to <clears throat> us to show some leadership here, yeah. whether it's official or unofficial, but, but we just need to be doing something. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Monty. Uh, Liz, uh, tell me if I'm running out of time here, because, uh, sorry, I don't like going back, but I've just been reflecting on Claire's points about DCs. I'm sitting here struggling to see the relationship between the DC policy and affordable housing or inclusionary zoning. Um, it, can, can that be explained to me? I, I, I can't see it. Yes, so inclusionary zoning requires developers who are doing a larger scale um, development, say 50 lots, that they provide a proportion of those to um, a charity or a community housing provider to develop cheaper houses on those particular lots. So that's what inclusionary zoning is. You can do that like they provide the lots as part of their development or they pay a financial contribution that would be the equivalent of being able to buy a section somewhere else. And so it just means that you can achieve a, a much lower price point um, year than if because the people that live in those houses don't necessarily have to pay for the land. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So mm. you just answered the question. So mm. there's a possibility that you can pay mm. as part of the Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's usually to provide the land. Um, yeah, or they or they just make it as part of their own development where they, they make some lots available. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's used. Yeah. Yeah. There's um there's another paper coming up shortly that you can talk about, uh, or the team will talk about inclusionary zoning. But as I, as I said, it'd be a financial contribution as opposed to a development contribution. I'd, I'd anticipate, but that can be clarified um, a bit later. Now, the, other, the only other final point I had. Um, Madam Chair, is, um, I, there's a whole number of appendices there, and I take them all as read, but importantly, um, we do develop a year-on-year -year comparison, and it's quite a useful um, 
uh, statistic if you if you do need to have a look at you know how we're going in terms of all of this monitoring and enforcement that we're doing so appendix six is really a good one um, and that just provides an update on, on how we're going in relation to each of these issues in comparison with with the previous years other than that um, just uh, go back to the recommendation that you receive the report look thank you Wayne okay we've got some some questions so we'll go back to Monty for his question and then to Claire and Lou uh, thanks. This is uh, to do with the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity, which comes into effect in four days, I believe. Um, the significant um, natural areas that have to be identified over the next five years. Just got a question about how that relates to our current policy on EBLs, Environment Benefit Lots. They've been quite a useful mechanism for those of us in the rural community to um, both identify, protect and fund the protection of SNAs. Is there any um, sort of um, implication of this new um, policy statement on our current use of EBLs? Uh, yeah, interesting. Look, um, I'm not sure if David Tomlin's here, but um, certainly in relation to uh, environmental benefit lots, that's a mechanism that has worked really well, um, and we're achieving some really good biodiversity gains for WIPA, um, both in relation to protection of um, indigenous um, uh, trees. Um, in fact, you know, I had, a, I had a, a good response from a landowner up in Tamaro in relation to a number of EBLs that we awarded um, to him and he was doing uh, native tree planting um, for harvesting in the future, um, selective harvesting, um, but it achieved some really good um, uh, really good biodiversity wins there for for that landowner, and that's just an example of of um, the ongoing protection that we have for um, for particularly for our for our um, indigenous trees, and, um, and and no doubt um, we have them for other things like uh, you know, peat lakes and margins, particularly. But the connection to the biodiversity side of things, um, I probably need some help on that. Look, look my look question up. is: Is there conflict with the new policy statement? Is is our current EBL policy yeah. practice? in trouble um yeah so this is similar to what happens at auckland council which i have experience with um so they brought in ecas with significant ecological areas and they also had the environmental protection lot subdivision um so essentially it didn't conflict um so if something was tagged as sna or sea um and it hadn't been used for a subdivision, if it had a, a, near, a level of qualifying area, then it could automatically qualify for an environmental benefit lot. Okay. Is it the continuation I, of the Yeah, just, just to yep. note that, the, that yep. the, the, the challenge that we have with the EBL regime is actually impacted by the highly productive soils NPS, probably less so I would have thought with the biodiversity NPS, but certainly the highly productive soils one. Okay. Or if there's, if there's no other questions on that matter, we'll move to Claire for a query and then Lou. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so in the appendices, I had a couple of queries on the growth cells and then one on the health statistics. So just on the growth cells, oh, this is on page 104, um, and this is in Te Oamutu, T is it T15. It says that they're not able to um, connect to the town water supply. Um, yeah, I was a bit surprised about that. Like, has that got pretty serious implications then for their desire to develop there? It says water connections were requested, but as this area is consented without them, um, and of the recommendation is that the infrastructure isn't really suitable, yeah, that connections are not likely to be granted. Yeah, look, uh, I'd have to defer to an um, engineer. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. That's on the outskirts of Kiki. Yeah. Uh, I'm just noting yeah. it. Um, rural residential um, area. Mm. Uh, I don't know what the pressure yeah, situations are for. I appreciate a bit of an update yeah, on so that. Yeah, so we can yeah. provide, I'll provide an update to you on that one. Yeah, and then just then below it, it's it's got Paturangi Road and industrial land. Um, and it's because I've been involved with the PC17 hearing, actually, Wayne, and um, hearing about the, the really critical shortage of available industrial land like is Tiamutu well placed for industrial land and meeting that demand because I was thinking it might not work all the time but if there are 
people in around the Cambridge area that are wanting to sort of set up businesses there that they mm. you know Tiamuta would be an alternative yeah and I'd hate to see it not being taken up because we also are pretty short over here in Tiamuta yeah look I'll, I'll, I'll um that's a really good question um and uh, we certainly uh, are uh, addressing the supply issues in Cambridge Te Aumutu, I'd have to check and see what the availability of industrial land is within our existing growth cells. I know there's still some availability, but to the extent of um, what is vacant within our defined growth areas, uh, we'd have to get those statistics and come back. I think we could provide a lot more uh, industrial area around Te um, uh, That's just what I'm sensing um, without having the statistics in front of me. So. I think that's a really good point um, and we'll provide a bit more information on that and see whether we need to do any more policy changes in respect to that issue. Mm. Like yeah. It was really highlighted to me when we were having our annual plan um, process and we got that information from um, quotable value on the, the price movement, you know, in various categories of, of land and the industrial land um, yeah, prices had gone up quite significantly, and I, I, you know, like that's an indicator. So if you could also get some info on what prices people are having to pay for industrial land too at the moment, it'd be helpful. Might be a bit off scope. I don't know. Yeah, I appreciate okay. that. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And then the second question I has was was um, on um, page uh, what's that? Page one twenty five of our report about health premises. In, oh, sorry, registered health premises. So that's in about the fourth line down in that matrix. You have been a, quite a significant reduction. Um, in the, this year, we've got 77 registered premises. Last year, we had two, 217. <coughs> Seems to be a pretty big redu reduction, and I'd be interested to know what's behind that, that large reduction. Because you wouldn't think that they would really, although I must admit, um, it might be an anomaly because the previous years were around the eighty mark actually, so it might have there might have been a bit of a glitch there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is page. You say page one two five of our agenda. I, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry. What? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Carl, yeah. do you have any update on that? Yeah. yeah. You're through the chair. I'd say that's an anomaly. That table was possibly added up three previous columns, maybe, or something. Oh, maybe. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The 217 would be an anomaly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Cool. Yeah. And look, and just adding um, to your point, Claire, just. Uh, your first point, actually, when I when I think about industrial land for Tiamusu, we always anticipated we'll see an uprise once we were able to deliver water to Tiamusu, uh, and so I'd be interested to see, you know, um, you know, how how far, you know, what kind of requests are coming through, what we are able to provide, uh, and what but what type, you know, because I think that the wheat industries was something we always identified as being able to potentially move ahead quite quickly, given the opportunity uh, we now put in front of. Uh, those prospective developers in terms of water. So that'd be an interesting thing to think. Oh, and David, yeah. would you like to come up to the microphone just so those that are online can hear? Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, David Topman, just on clear, clear your question regarding growth cells and industrial land supply and demand. Um, the update on future proof that Kirsty talked about that will be coming to you as a um, mail out on Friday. It's the first one will be this Friday. Um, she also pointed out the delay in the future proof future development strategy work. One of the key reasons why that work has been delayed is market economics is still busy doing our housing and business capacity assessment. We have to do these every three years under the M the National Policy Statement for Urban Development. And um, the work, particularly on industrial land, has been delayed. Um, we've had over-promised and under-delivered um, work on that. So we're still waiting. So be able to report back about Tiamutu in particular, about what the situation is there. But, um, Madam Chair, you raised a really good point about the water supply. That was a key constraint previously that's been resolved. So you, all things being considered, you'd think 
it would be a good candidate. Yep. Thank you. All right. Now, Lou, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, through, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much for your report, Wayne. Great. I want to go back to the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity and just raise one point. Firstly, when they talk of 10%, is that over the whole district or is that a localised thing? I'm going to need my expert on that one. Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> that's the first part of the question uh, because, as I say, it, it gets pretty difficult in an environment. Um, so it's 10% in the urban areas. So each urban, urban area. area has so we can't sort of offset Munga Tree. No, against. no. So it's for a particular urban area, they have to have at least 10% of vegetation cover. Okay. Yeah. The second point I wanted to raise was this is going to actually add quite some significant costs to our operation as, as a council because I see that we have to map and identify and write up every significant or every SNA uh, yeah. within our area as a local territorial authority. Yeah, we so can, how do we on charge it? We can't on charge it. We can't no, continue. So we it. would need to work, I think, with Waikato Regional Council, who have a lot of that data already. Um, and so we would work alongside them with um, mapping. And usually what happens is they will use the aerial maps to identify where there are large stands of bush. And generally then they, someone would do a drive-by um, to check that it's native um, and it's qualifying. Yeah. Okay, so we work with the Waikato Regional yeah. under that. That would be under the new legislation for the strategic plan that they're talking about under the Resource yeah. Management Act. Right. The third question I'd like to ask was quietly that if we do this, this is going to add significant costs to any resource consent because we're going to have another tier of, uh, you know, investigation or criteria to actually adjust to that. So when we look at a resource consent, we have to look at indigenous biodiversity. That's right. Yeah. Which would could add quite significant costs to developments. Yeah. Uh, so I guess in terms of um, costs, it would be ecology related, um, providing those ecological assessments, um, ensuring that we are mitigating the effects. Yeah. Okay. It's just interesting. I read this and I thought that there's quite a, a lot more in this than it initially so seems. Is, yeah. Well, thank you for your answer. All right, um, Mike. Question. Yeah, again through the chair, and again possibly a little off scope, but if it, if it's not, it would fit into this report. Back to the vaping, um, I know there's legislation changes taking place. It would just be nice to get an overview from a council perspective of what role we play in that. Um, of any changes that are coming. And just a question, um, with alcohol, you obviously have to be licensed. Now, I understand vaping, you don't. Are there any any controls that council currently have over vaping? Uh, they're not just vaping shops for themselves, but any place that sells vaping, whether it be supermarkets, dairies, vape shops, are there any controls currently in place? Uh, again, not a Carl question, but as I say, I, I think we've taken the point and we'll, we'll bring a report back yeah. to the committee on things such as what is our responsibilities, what is yeah. our level of um, controls that we do have in this area, mm. Um, what is the any changes that might be coming through in the legislation? Um, those are the points I, I picked up that yep. you've raised. Yep. Um, unless there's anything further, Carl, about you want to add? No, it doesn't sound like we've got much at the moment. So I'll, I'll um, we'll come back to you on on that. We'll committee back to you on that. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I mean, my gut feeling is at the moment it's not a lot, but just because it's not a lot doesn't mean we can't be more proactive than yep. the bare minimum. So thank you. Okay, everybody, um, are there any other queries uh, or questions on this report? No, but we'll go back to page 67. We've got a recommendation there to receive the report. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Lou is going to move it. Claire is going to second it. All in favour? Aye. Carried. Thank you, everybody. All right, we'll move on to our next item, which is the uh, Scope Plan Change 21, the Housing General Review. And... Uh, Phil Nicola is going to present this with Tony. Um, good morning. So I'll take the report as read and just go through some of the highlights. Um, so Scope Plan, uh, Plan Change 21 was a housing general review that was approved, um, the scope of it was approved in 2021. So it was to enable affordable housing, strengthen the urban design provisions in the plan and investigate the rezoning of growth cells T6 and C11. 
Um, with plans change 26 for residential intensification, um, this plan change got put on hold, but now we are revisiting the scope and trying to get it live again. Um, so in terms of the scope, there's been a number of additional matters that we would like to bring into it uh, as a result of the plan change 26 process. So this will include um, rezoning properties along Gulf Road and Kahiki Road. So currently they're zoned rural, but have a large lot residential size. Um, reconsideration of secondary dwellings, particularly in the large lot residential areas. Um, character clusters, introducing uh, new character clusters within the areas and um, additional provisions in relation to those zones. Um, additional development controls for development adjoining railway lines, so a five metre building set back from des the designation, extending the acoustic control um, from 40 metres to 100 metres from the rail corridor and 60 metre vibration control from the rail corridor. Um, in terms of commercial corrections facilities, adding a definition into the plan and a consenting pathway into the plan for these, either as a permitted activity or requiring resource consent. Uh, we're looking at the commercial zoning frame, um, so having a zoning hierarchy to reflect the different commercial centres throughout the district. And then also adding some ecological provisions into the plan, um, so having a river gully overlay, increased building setbacks from public areas and significant natural areas, and greater protection for street trees and trees on public spaces. Um, as part of this, because the scope has now become quite large, we were looking to um, seek an, um, approval for another plan change to solely deal with the inclusionary zoning. So. Um, Attached to the report is some draft provisions that have already been provided by the Waikato Housing Initiative. So we feel like we've already advanced um, to some extent in that area. So we would like to proceed with a separate plans change solely for the inclusionary zoning. So we would have plan change 21 to deal with all the other residential matters and uh, another new plan change for the inclusionary zoning. Thanks, Nicola. Any questions? Clear. Yeah, thanks. So just about that inclusionary zoning. Yeah, I'm a bit disappointed that we're hoping it would be in the um, the plan change that activated, you know, the medium density residential standards and it was taken out of that. And then we thought, oh, well, it will be in this one. No, it's been taken out of this one. So I'd put another one. So yeah, I'm a bit disappointed in the delays that it's likely to um, incur because of that. I can understand the, the, um, the logic behind it. Um, one of the risks is that it will be challenged. And so there was an advantage in um, it being part of a combined plan change with other councils. Yeah. Uh, and so I can appreciate that you only want a council that's ready to go, not one that's also going to add the delays. So I was, I was wondering whether or not there are other councils, uh, particularly, you know, um, in the North Island that might be ready to go that we could partner with or something. Yeah, I guess it's probably going to create more work than <laughs> than solve things. Yeah, I can pick that one up, Madam Chair. Um, yep. So there are mm. um, Queensland Lakes District Council has a plan change, as you know, undergoing at the moment. So we're looking to them to be early adopters. Um, in the North Island, we're next, okay. and Hamilton City Council and Waikato District Council, from a meeting yesterday that we had with them, um, are on board with inclusionary zoning, mm. but they're not ready. Mm. So so the way it's playing out in terms of timeframes is that WIPA, because as you say, we had already given some thought around this in PC26, mm. was out of scope of that. What we're proposing now is that we take it out as a standalone plan change to enable it to go faster, but also to ring fence it. Mm. Um, and so with the model provisions that the Waikato Housing Initiative has very helpfully given us, um, we've now got sufficient confidence to advance as a plan change. Yes, we expect it to be um, challenged. We expect it to be robustly considered through the hearing process, but that's expected. Mm. And in preparing it, we'll make sure that we've got defensible evidence going up. So mm. we have talked about um, potentially partnering with Hamilton and Waikato, but they're just not ready yet. Okay. And so the way it's likely to play out is individual plan changes, a little bit like the IPI plan changes. So individual plan changes, but with a common underlying oh, policy yeah. basis. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Monty and then Mike. Uh, Tony, that just following up on that, what is your anticipated time frame for a new plan change on inclusion, inclusionary we, zoning? We haven't got that yet. We're waiting for the decision today. 
And if the decision today is to confirm taking it out as a standalone plan change, then Nicola's team would pull together a project plan um, and they'd look at timeframes then and we'd, we'd engage with Future Proof in doing that as well to make sure we're online with Future Proof. Realistically, we wouldn't be notifying anything this side of Christmas, I would have thought, just because there's a bit of work that we have to do behind it. So probably early 24 is my feel, but that's to be confirmed. Okay. Uh, Mike? Yeah, through the chair. So I just want to get a couple of clarifications. So this plan change is is council lead by any council that wishes to write things. And just to confirm that anything anything above subdividing off one section is going to incur an additional cost above the development contributions. So that's all what we've got to work through. So the model that we're looking at at the moment is based on the Queenstown Lakes District model. And as, as Claire mentioned, it's for developments above a certain threshold, and we've still got to determine what that is. So whether it's the fifth or above unit or whatever that is, then they are required to provide a financial contribution, not a development contribution. It could be land, it could be money, it could be a combination. And there's a percentage, a value percentage of the development. So say, you know, clear use an example. So say it's 500 lots and the contribution is 10%. And that's 50 lots or the value of 50 lots that the plan change will say they're required to provide. For free. Um, sure. at, at the cost of development, but at the cost mm. to the developer, it's not for free. Um, yeah. Develop and there's incentives that we are looking at putting in there as well. So the incentives that we're looking at putting in are on the basis of transferable development rights. So, for example, we could offer higher density in the same development. So they get a higher yield to offset the cost of offering affordable housing. Right. Or transferable developments off-site that could be sold a little bit like the EBLs could be sold to a third party. So, for example, there might be an industrial developer who wants to have a higher gross floor area. If you're a developer and you're offering affordable housing, you could sell your TDR for that higher floor area. All right. So there's All right. some incentives that we're looking at. All right. That's good to get a bit more clarification because on the surface, um, I'd use the word, oh, I was disgusted. <laughs> um, yeah, this, but it's good to get a bit more clarification. So I'm sure you will have some feedback on this, and I hope there's plenty of it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions for Tony or Nicola on this item? Otherwise, we have a, a recommendation on page 136, A and B. Do I have a mover and a seconder, please, to... Uh, Yep, thank you. Marcus is going to move this, and seconder is going to be clear. Uh, all in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Okay, thanks uh, both. I think you're both going to stay in the, in the same seat because we'll move on to uh, <laughs> our next item, which is scope for plan change 30, a minor technical amendments. Thank you. So um, plan change 30 is um, relating to minor technical amendments to the district plan that have arisen from comments received internally, externally to rules that don't um, work or work very well. So um, included in that is um, amending the rules in the rural section in relation to the shelter belt, so maintaining six metre height, um, creating new rules in relation to crop protection structures, um, and section 17, um, removing the, the size restriction on solar power generation collection panels attached to buildings to enable them to be greater as with permitted activity. Um, and also generating um, plan provisions for solar farms, um, removing the reference to the uplifting of quarry buffer zones by way of a council resolution. Um, there's a rule in the rural plan section for that um, to remove that rule because it's legally incorrect and can only be done by a plan change process. Um, revising the provisions in section 19, the hazardous substances chapter, to remove rules that are regulated by other legislation, such as the um, natural environmental National Environmental Standards for Contaminated Soil and the Hazardous Substances and New Organ Organisms Act 1996. Um, removing the flood hazard overlay from the planning maps, so um, still having rules in relation to, to flooding and development of flooded areas, but removing that overlay so when new flooding data is available, we don't need to go through a plan change process to update the maps. Um, increasing the number of events at the Cambridge Town Hall Piazza. Currently, only two can occur as a permitted activity, so we're looking to increase that number. 
um, and also the animal nuisance bylaw that came out in 2022 um, regulates the keeping of animals in residential areas. So we're looking to remove any district plan rules that refer to the keeping of animals in those zones. Um, reviewing the rules in relation to light, spill and glare from commercial, industrial and developments close to residential properties. So there's some um, difficulty in monitoring these and, and in terms of the standards and, and the effects. Um, and then changing the noise rules in relation to St Kilda in particular, because currently the background noise levels exceed the permitted noise levels. So anything would require resource consent and it's hard to monitor any um, resource consents as well or noise complaints in that area. Thanks, Nicola. Okay, queries. We've got, we'll start with Philip and then Claire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, page two of your report, or your agenda, or page two of your report, mentions shelter belts. I don't know if this is appropriate or not. The colour of shelter belts, um, a lot of them and around the country seem to be white, but there's green and black and things like that. Why is it quite why is it more often that it's, that it's white than any other colour? Can that, because that was brought up recently yeah. with kiwi fruit and things like that, can that be scrapped or? Um, so that's the shade cloth. So our understanding was that they were white just to let the light through, um, but we're doing some more investigation to the, the colours of those, yeah, and whether it would be appropriate to remove white ones and just have green and black. Because it was commented by members of the community that it may be more acceptable if it's a... Hmm. If it's a, a darker colour. Yeah, than, visually they're better mm, green and black, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Claire and then Monty. Um, yeah, thanks. It's a, on the same um, subject about those um, crop protection structures. Um, so are there any um, maximum heights of those crop protection structures that, you know, like, or they can be any size that's deemed needed, you know, for the... Yeah, the crop that it's protecting. I think it depends on the crop that it's protecting. Um, yeah. From the research I've seen, generally eight metres in height. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I mean, the proposal is that there wouldn't be any setback. Yeah, so they will be right on the boundary. Well, no, yeah. there would still be setback from the boundary. Oh, there would be still set. Oh, okay. So there would be setback from the. It's just reducing them, but I thought potentially. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what it's likely to be reduced to? Um, no, that's something we would need to come to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, but at the moment, there's no maximum that's set. It's just left to the property owner as to determining what they might might choose. As yeah. In terms of the height? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, but I'm comfortable with that. But, yeah, I recall the discussion at the workshop. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Claire. Monty? Yeah, just to be following on from those two questions, um, all we're doing here is approving a scope of investigation because these are highly technical matters like colour of shelter belts and That's stuff. That's right. We're just wanting to, to approve the scope and then we'll go out and research those yeah. things in more detail and come up with some draft provisions. With the appropriate evidence base and everything. Yeah. 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 Thanks. It's probably worth adding, Madam Chair, too. This, this is in response to, you know, some challenges that we've had. Mm. So they're not radical changes, really, that has been proposed here. In terms of height, for example, that's existing. My understanding is we haven't had any... Um, you know, any concerns around height being permitted in terms of the structures themselves and the way they operate. So um, just bear that in mind in terms of the context of these changes as they're in response to tidying up and improving some rules and, and making it easy for everyone to, to work with them. Um, and they'll go through a process, of course, when we get ready. Okay, thanks. Lou. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just quickly, Tony, I, I just wanted to ask something about solar power, if anything. There will be a plan changes, I believe, it, for having solar farms, or will there be something that we would incorporate at a future date? That's what we're looking at, because there's been a bit of interest in some solar farms. We yeah. understand there yeah. might be one kicking around, so we're looking at how we can enable that. That's because I, I actually know of a, a prior you know, an application that might be put in mm. that is, might be, you know, a part of our future. So, yeah, I'm just wondering whether we would incorporate that. Would the size of panels, would there be limitations in, you know, on one property for, the you know, having a size? Is, is there something in there, uh, you know, to limit somebody with a very large panel, for example? I should say that they have a look at you know, refraction and, and mm. light refraction. Mm whether it, there'd be something for, you know, a, what, how to put it, having an, an impact on the local area 
Well, that's the kind of thing we'll be looking at, you know, glare, um, refraction, as you say, those sort of things. And also, it occurs to me too, I was just reading this morning, that there's now new technology where they can harness power from raindrops on panels. And so um, we need to start thinking about sort of future-proofing new energy and enabling that in a way that doesn't create a whole lot of different effects. So that'll all be part of the mix of what we're looking at. Mm. Okay, everybody, if everyone's uh, had their questions answered, we've got a uh, recommendation uh, to well, A and B. Uh, can I move in a second, please? So thank you, Philip. Thank you, Mike. All in favour? Right. Against? Carried. Thank you both. Okay, I think we're going to move on to the uh, next item, which is our urban design planning assessments update. Thank you. I'll introduce this one, but I'll ask Nicola today. She's actually had experience in working with the Auckland UDP, so it's probably worth any questions coming through. Sure. So. Um, this is quite a nice kind of wrap up for me in a way because when I first started here one of the first jobs that Wayne had asked me to do was look at our urban design and were we doing it right, did we need an urban design panel. Um, so I've appended an initial or, or a, an early report uh, memo actually that I put through on some findings at that time. This is just revisiting that in the light of some intensification and urban design coming to the fore again. So um, it was an internal review um, uh, and by senior staff, Nicola was involved, I was involved, Quentin. We've all variously worked with urban, divine, uh, urban development panels uh, in, our, in our careers, so we can offer some experience and insight around that. Um, we looked at what we're doing at the moment, and we had six recommendations in the earlier memo. We looked at uh, what we're doing now on, in light of those recommendations. Then we set out in the report um, what our findings were, and then we wrapped it up with some recommendations. Um, the recommendations are that we've implemented a lot of the recommendations that we had through the earlier memo, and we don't feel there's a need or justification at this point to have an urban design panel. There was one thing I just want to draw your attention to, and that's, um, I'm not sure what page of the agenda it is, but it's under item E, urban design is in the eye of the beholder, so it's just before where those pictures are. This was a bit of a revelation to me. So this was expert evidence presented by an expert urban designer as part of Plan Change 26 from Kainga Order, so a qualified expert. And if you look at these pictures, this really highlights to me, and I was reflecting on this in a preparation of this as, as well, really highlights to me that this is about architectural design. It's about architectural form. And so the evidence that was presented here shows pictures of buildings, and you can agree or not whether they look nice. Um, but it's about architectural form, not about urban design as we understand it and as the New Zealand Urban Design Protocol explains it. And so um, on page six of my report, I talk about it as a fuzzy, undefined mashup, and it still kind of feels like that a little bit. So I was one of the founding members of New Zealand Urban Design Forum way back, um, and it's an emerged as a technology, emerged as a profession, but it still has a bit of confusion around architectural form versus placemaking which is when I think of urban design. So that's something to bear in mind as well when we talk about urban design, just understanding what we're talking about. So the summary there on the last page, um, we don't believe an urban design panel is considered at the moment in my part. Um, we are still looking at professional upskilling of, of the team. Um, and Plan Change 21 does introduce some strengthening of urban design in the district plan as well. So we think that we're in a pretty good place. Happy to take any questions. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Tony. Hey, um, I think I'll, I'll kick this off because because it's probably no secret around the table that I've been actively um, looking at an urban design panel, and that's largely, I guess, pressure that I've had uh, from you know I think professional um, businesses uh, who who feel Cambridge is maybe losing its way a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to cite Antanas Prasuta because uh, he is a big advocate of a urban design panel. So when I look around Cambridge and the, I guess the growth we're experiencing. Um, we're always cited as having great uh, forebears and having the hindsight and the foresight, um, including the design, but also the architecture of Cambridge. But I do think, and I think others sort of feel like we're sort of losing some of our, a little, little bit of our way at the moment. And sometimes the designs are largely uh, cost driven as opposed to adding to the existing ambience. Um, so I do think an urban design panel uh, would probably add some pressure uh, to do better. And I, and I guess that's probably all I was kind of looking for. And perhaps there's no more important time than now. Every time I drove, go through a wee, a drive uh, through Waipa, but particularly in Cambridge, it looks like a new building um, is starting its life. I don't want to point out any specific buildings, but I'm starting to feel a little bit anxious um, 
And while traditional design may not be the way forward, uh, given the diversity of Cambridge that we have now, um, but perhaps uh, we should be putting and, and looking for our best skills and design our town collectively. So firstly, I agree that the district plan needs more teeth. Um, you know, and so an urban design panel uh, would, would potentially be really effective, but we'd need to need to look at the district plan. The second um, point I wanted to make is that, no, it's not going to be easy. Um, and I think you referred to that numerous times, um, Tony, and I absolutely appreciate it. When I look at the Hamilton Urban Design Panel, it's got 14 people on it, and it would require multiple skill sets and experience around the table. A lot of expertise would be needed in architecture, planning, engineering, arts, landscape, architectural, um, but also just want to incorporate and mana whenua um, in our towns as well. Often we are criticised and saying that they don't uh, necessarily feel that they are visible in our towns. So I think it's worth noting that while not well-defined, urban design is, um, as the name suggests, a design you know, discipline um, and therefore does require professionals with design training and experience uh, to provide a meaningful assessment and feedback. I appreciate it's going to be a cost to council. Um, however, it would probably be useful to compare this with the perceived cost to the community if we have what I would think a poor urban design outcome. So I just wanted to make those, those kind of points. Um, appreciate the work that you've put in, Tony, and, and your expertise in this space. But as I said, it just feels to me at the moment no time. Our time is, is now if we want to if we want to collectively look at how um, our towns might be um, being through growth, you know, how our towns look and feel. So um, yeah, open up the floor to other other points of view and perspectives, Claire. Yeah, thanks, Liz. And I'm I'm really pleased to have the discussion actually because um, I think all of us who are elected members do um, are made very aware by residents that, that they they care a lot about the look and feel of where they live. Yeah. Um, um, I'm also aware though, like that with that medium density um, residential standard, we can't consider amenity. Is that right? So there are some controls there which are really reducing our ability to sort of insist on it. Yeah, on, on that to be taken into account. I, I actually support um, the triggers, you know, for larger scale um, developments, which I think would remain if we didn't go ahead with um, appointing an urban design panel at this stage. And so I'm really comfortable with that because I am conscious that it does in, increase costs and time and all that. Um, but from what I've heard from Liz, it's worthwhile, you know, and we're talking about permanent things that are there for years. Yeah, so uh, I can I can definitely see what you're coming from. I was actually really keen to have some kind of panel uh, working in the um, affordable housing space because something that I've um, heard about is that to get um, lower cost consents for affordable housing, if you've had an urban design team that have come up with a design that would be acceptable, if, if um, someone wants to do affordable housing on a lot, they choose that design that's gone through a process and so their resource consent processing costs are reduced. Uh, I was keen to see something like that um, being done at WIPA because I, I do hear uh, that affordable housing is a real issue in, um, in WIPA, so that's, that's why I'm pushing it. So, yeah, I, I was keen to do, um, see something like that happen. Um, I also agree about needing professionals if, if that's the way we went because I feel it, it could, as you said, the eye of the beholder and you need to make sure that you're having absolute best practice and a broad view, holistic view taken that um, if we were going to do it, yeah, I think we'd have to do it really well and be absolutely squeaky clean on who's on there and why, what skills they bring to it. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Uh, any other comments? Andrew? Uh, I'll get used to this, like everyone else. Um, I, I Look, I, I, I hear your comments and understand where you're coming from, I guess. Um, it does strike me, as Claire's just alluded to, that it's pretty subjective, even when you've got experts, um, uh, you know, on your panel. And... Um, potentially runs the risk of exacerbating what we already see with, um, you know, you can kind of tell when, when that house was built, it was in that era, this one, that era, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot to be brought to the 
to, you know, to be effective at really, you know, taking a, a hundred year view or more, which you'd need to, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Monty. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, it's quite a complicated issue, I think, this one. I just wanted to make a comment on behalf of Cambridge Community Board, because I know that over the four years I've been sitting there, they're pretty um, pretty keen on sort of urban design as a concept and, and maintaining um, the look and feel of Cambridge. So I, I can't directly speak for them in terms of uh, an urban design panel, but it's something that's of, um, of real interest to them. Probably my question would be, um, places that have, do have these, um, these panels, is there evidence of better outcomes or not? That's that's kind of what this comes down to because you sort of, it, it's kind of funny, you think, um, like I use my Cambridge example again, everyone says, oh, you know, look, the look and feel of Cambridge, um, that was created without urban design panels, right? It was just created organically at the time and people liked it. So where's, I'm not, not challenging this, I don't even have an opinion either way, but where's the evidence of outcomes? That might be something Nicola can perhaps respond to, but before she does, um, it, that's, that's a really pertinent question. And what was running through my mind is what problem are we trying to solve? So is there a problem that we're trying to solve? That's one thing. And the second one is what, what do you do if you get a panel that provides advice because council doesn't have powers to impose or mandate or require or legislate for the look and feel of a building? It's beyond our powers. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the problem at the moment with the existing panels is all we can do, all they can do, is offer suggestions that developers choose to pick up or not. And so I'm not sure if you've had any experience in Auckland around um, the outcomes. Yeah, so my experience as a, a consenting planner for major developments is generally um, if you say to a developer, you take it to the urban design panel, um, they will say, no, don't want to, don't need to, I've got my own urban designers. It's going to have no value for it, um, my development, and it's a cost to, to them. Um, so there's nothing I can do as a consenting planner. Um, it's just they won't go. If you can get them to go, um, then you can get useful comments back um, and it can enable um, better development. For the ones that do take up the offer of an urban design panel and their comments are generally the ones which they know they're pushing the boundaries, um, so they're trying to get some support. Um, and you do get better outcomes. So things like uh, retirement villages, apartment buildings, um, where they're not really um, anticipated, that you can get some good outcomes there. But um, again, there's a, you have to rely on the developer taking on board those comments received. And sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. And generally, if they won't, it's because there's a cost implication for them. Yeah, no, look, you're, yeah, some, some of that I agree with, but you're right. I mean, this is about just adding uh, some pressure mm -hmm. uh, to developers to do better. Yeah. And um, I think we're starting to see in Cambridge particularly, um, you know, some urban design, which I'm frankly just disappointed with. Uh, so it's about just applying that pressure um, to do better. That's, that's I guess, uh, uh, what I was hoping for. But um, I guess Hamilton City has a really has a, I think I understand a very successful um, panel. I would have liked to have seen. Um, I have canvassed those councillors myself, and they said that absolutely it has made a difference, um, and it, uh, it is not something they're looking to uh, do away with. In fact, they're, they're very keen to keep it. So, just put that out there. Um, Dale Marie, yeah. uh, tēnā kōrua, tēnā koe tāni moto, um, i tēnā rā. Um, I suppose in regards to the panel and in, in fear of creating more work for others to do on a panel. Um, I'm just going to give a little context that I, I talked to you about yesterday um, with the induction that we had. Um, I was privileged to be part of urban design with regards to Massey University refits and also um, a marae that they've just done down there. Both of those um, places I was privileged to be part of their urban design. Um, we got Best Design Awards for those types of things. And two of the distinct um, comments that came out of that was the collective of the panel that came out with that outcome. So um, as we know, there, we do have some evidence at the moment that reflects that 
particularly for Indigenous Māori, we don't see ourselves here. And I think that's also reflective in some of the design. Um, and as I brought up yesterday in the induction, it's quite clear that maybe with the earthquake as well in Christchurch, um, Ngai Tuahuriri and Ngai Tahu are very visual in the urban design planning. So um, as I mentioned yesterday, I don't think we want to um, engage with us and invest with us when we don't have these um, diverse panels and these diverse ways of working together, I can see why they wouldn't want to invest in us as a council with some of our projects. So just a comment that I think that's that's an area that I think we should maybe explore a little bit more. And yes, I think we could take some more leadership in a collaborative approach about how we do some of this urban design. Mm. Tato. Okay, any other comments around the table? Susan. Um, can the learner wheels on that one? Um, yeah, look, take your, take your point um, quite, um, quite honestly, um, Dale. Yeah, walking around um, Christchurch over the week here, the last week, it's, it's been quite an eye opener in the way that, um, I mean, they've really made lemonade out of lemons, right? And, and, and had, They've been in an unenviable position um, initially, but they've really managed to turn it right around. I mean, it's a spectacular city um, in terms of its walkability. It feels really safe. It feels open, feels calm, and it feels incredibly um, tasteful. And, um, and I mean, we did the walking tour with, um, the, with one of the gentlemen from the Runanga that had been involved with, with that whole um, um, co-design, if you like, of of the rebuild of some of the significant features in the central city and the the place based storytelling tally, sto place based storytelling that has un been undertaken in that context is quite spectacular. And at the same time, um, it just sort of seamless. It, it acknowledges the the very colonial feel, but obviously the the other more indigenous aspects about the area in a, in a really sensitive and um, beautiful way. So it can be done exceptionally well. So uh, I yeah, I'm, I'm just underline your comments in terms of the fact that things can be done in a very seamless and cooperative way, and you get a really cool result, as is as is pretty evident from Christchurch. But I'm, I mean. Realistically, they sort of had a bit of a blank slate to start with in some respects, regrettably for them, but they've really, they've really used it, that really support, sad opportunity beautifully and switched to their advantage in, in many aspects. Claire. So just responding to Dale's great comments, actually, um, really interesting to hear that. Um, the, the, propo the proposal that we've got is whether or not we should support the establishment of a... Um, an urban design panel, which would generally be available for quite a number of, I presume, larger scale developments. Whereas um, from Dale's experience, I would imagine that was one particular stakeholder, you know, like one site um, that used this approach to achieve some really great design outcomes. They were willing to do it. You know, they were committed to it. Um, and in fact, we have got a project like that in our long-term plan. Yeah, coming up with thinking about what council is going to do with our buildings yeah so i could see you know that might be a possibility there um but generally i'm not convinced that we personally uh, yeah my, my personal view is we shouldn't really be looking at a, a panel that would be available generally for um developers to try and work with i mean i you know what you've said nicola you know because they don't have to They'll just say, well, no, you know, I've got my own or, you know, I've already done it somewhere. So, um, but but, but I, I'm relying on those triggers that are um, in our processes already, that if it's, you know, at a certain scale, that then it's an ex expectation. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so that's where I'm sitting at the moment. Sorry. No, no, no. I absolutely res respect that. And uh, I guess this is just an opportunity to do better if, if we uh, feel that we're in a position to be able to do that. Um, so I haven't heard from some councillors. Um, Philip, where are you at? Mike? Yeah, hi, I'm happy to chip in. <clears throat> I mean, with the panel, I, I just wondered too about, you're going to, in my mind, have some influential, pretty onto it people in there. And are they straight away then going to be conflicted out of, is it going to create conflict issues would be my first question. Um, 
Angie, yeah, and it does get back to it's so voluntary. I mean, we talked about this years ago in the community board as a like a charter and the same sort of concept, and it, it didn't get any traction back then. Um, so I'm not opposed to it, but it's just I really the cost benefit. If there's a cost, a significant cost accounts, I'd really question it. Um, can this be something that can be done up as sort of a an expectation or a charter or whatever around certain areas with some of these growth cells it doesn't have to involve an ongoing committee so I just tell you different ways of trying to achieve a similar objective without ongoing cost I guess that's something that could be developed reviewed developed you know reviewed etc it does feel that there's a lot of unanswered questions so I don't know about the cost I don't know whether if the Hamilton one is if they volunteers are they paid I have absolutely no idea I'd probably like to see the terms of reference actually for the Hamilton panel um, and understand how that one actually operates. So, I mean, that might be helpful, I think, um, okay. to, to, to have that come back to us because we're not, we're not, the recommendation is to simply to receive your report. Um, but, you know, we, we, we could continue to um, have a think about how we might implement it. But um, are there any other comments anyone wants to make? No other real comments to add, but just even last night um at a community event i mean we have members of the community all the time saying how our ta town's changing so much our region and things like that and uh, you know at the end of the day a lot of people don't like to see change um that's the other issue as well but uh you know um our town is growing the rest of the country is growing and we've got to make sure we get it right um as well so uh, but whether there, there is an issue um whether there uh, you know uh, is there a problem is there not we need to identify that too and and uh, to to you know. okay all right hey well uh, uh, if, unless there's anyone else that wants to marcus yeah i think the whole design issue is i mean it's all down to personal preferences mm -hmm. as well and feel and, and if you have um you know skilled people around well they've probably designed these homes and stuff anyway so there could be a big conflict of interest but i'm, I'm happy with how it's going yeah. um yeah and i think the extra cost um and skills and stuff we just we just don't have enough information mm -hmm. um what it's this is going to unlock it's the same with those the new three by three um housing lots as well it's really going to depend on the developer um and who's developing them some are going to be done amazingly well and going to look unbelievable and and tie in with with the feel of our towns and regions and there's some that aren't mm. and um and that's up to us then too to for, for council to you know approve them and have standards and all that sort of mm. thing well. I, guess, I guess philip that's my point and that if mm. if we had a panel that we could and you know try and put some pressure on uh, for those developers uh, to do better um, and to and to look at uh, you know yeah, it's like councillor better Gow urban design councillor mm. Gower just said I mean it is everyone's individual and in architecture and, and paintings you know whether you buy this painting or not mm. and um, but there is some homes three by three homes now that are built and personally my view they look terrible and um they may look good sort of now but in five years time 10 years 15 20 and 100 years time you know as we see homes now so um mm. Madam Chair, we can bring a report back um there's a number of comments in there that we can respond to um just two things probably in terms of wrapping up we can bring a report back with some more information if you like that with some details around cost plans yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's. I would like to see probably understand how the Hamilton one works a bit better because I understand that works very well and uh, no point reinventing anything if it works well there. Um, we may consider it. So I guess just having more information on that particular model would be helpful. So, yeah. It's Is it, been yeah. a good discussion. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is something we hear about a lot, you know, that we're losing our, our losing our village feel or, you know, losing some of our ways. So, um, Monty and then Mike. Um just helping trying to wrap this up as well i mean tony the staff recommendation is status quo right but i'm sort of sensing around the table mm -hmm. but maybe uh, appetite for uh, further investigation so in your in your summary on page 166 uh, uh, point c you refer to plan change 21 includes a review and strengthening of the existing urban design provisions could we um wrap up that into 
into into that piece of work rather than the straight operating as a standalone um, thing going forward. I don't know, just as a suggestion. But so I think a panel is slightly different. So so we're going to look at the urban design and plan regardless. But there's two points probably I'll pick up. One is that we do have some legal constraints. So three by three, we as as Claire said, we've got a legal um, impediment to dictating what those three by three look like. We've there's some legislation that says we can't do that. Um, and so that's why in item C, it says as far as possible in the RMS, that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, uh, and, and understand the benefits and the value of doing, of doing an urban design panel. But I guess I'd just caution around expectation management of outcomes. So I have been involved with some big box retailers, food stars and countdown previously in past life, where we were looking to modulate big tilt slab um, walls and we threw urban design at them, we threw urban design panels at them. And in the end, the expectations were we can do what we want. So yes, we can pressure developers, but again, it comes back to that legal mandate that council has to dictate design and the willingness of developers to accept that. So mm. look, I look, I absolutely appreciate all those things. Um, but I'd like to thank our developers. Most of them live locally. Yeah. They want to do the right yeah. thing. So it's just about opening their minds around um, a lot of the comments, you know, that uh, Dale Marie has, has um, raised today, I just don't think ever factor into their urban design. And I just think now is the time to consider that. Um, look, so I think at the, at the moment, yeah, it sounds like it might be a bit hard to thread <laughs> um, that, that uh, plan change into this. So I'm, I'm happy with the recommendation, which is just to receive the report, but on the on the proviso that we get more information um, about the, and, and let's just bring it back for an, another workshop at some point. Uh, it's it's kind of too important, you know, it's kind of, this is this is the, the time where we're seeing so much growth and this is an opportunity for us to, to really look at how we uh, collectively design our town that's reflective of the diversity of our town too. Uh, so I think that's really critical. Marcus. Well, yeah, and just one final thing, like with our town management plans and stuff like that, like they should be built into those anyway, how we want to feel like, you know, we've got a, we've got how we want our main streets to feel and stuff. Maybe we could do some more work in there to roll out to the surrounding homes and stuff as well. Absolutely, I understand. And finally, Mike. Yeah, and just off the back of that, I mean, we're not just talking residential here. Particularly with all this earthquake improvement stuff, there's some lines in the sand of when things have to be redeveloped, bold, or strengthened. Um, so again, you know, just the scope is is all encompassing. Mm, okay. All right. Hey, we've got so a recommendation there to receive the report. So kind of a move and a second, please. Uh, Philip will move. Andrew. Yep. <laughs> Philip will move. Um, Andrew will second. All in favour. Against carried. Now, I'd just like to thank Tony. I think this might be your last meeting, I believe. Do you think it is? Okay. And look, I just want to just thank you on behalf of all um, you know, the councillors around the table uh, that, and Roger, who's not here, um, that, yeah, it's been an, a real pleasure working with you, actually. Um, you know, you any queries I ever have, you're back as quick as a flash, but I always get some excellent advice um, from you, and I really wish you well. Um, uh, at uh, Otorohonga District Council. I think, obviously, um, this is uh, yeah, a good move for you into a group manager role, so I congratulate you on that um, on that position, but thank you for your work at YPAR as well. Thank you, appreciate that. <clears throat> She's, yeah, we've got a bit of time from, yeah. Okay, everybody, uh, we will move on to our next item, which is our six monthly community board reporting. Uh, we will have Elise online, and I believe, um, is Ange coming through? Oh, there's Ange. Ange is, oh, he was behind the chair. Ange is here as well. So, um, welcome, Ange. Good to have you, and Elise online. So, uh, over to you, Joe. Good morning. Um, this is the first uh, set of reporting on um, this triennium from the community boards. Um, due to timing, I'm just going to hand straight over to um, each community board. So we'll start with um, Elise Badger from the Cambridge Community Board, who's first up, you've got your memo and your report. So welcome, Elise. Kia ora koutou. thank you for having me. Can you hear me well enough in the room? Great, okay. Hey, um, I will just take the report as read and open up the floor to you uh, for any questions that you might have. 
Oh, I have a question. Well, not really a question, Elise, but just um, I know that one of your, your top priorities um, has always been a new Cambridge Library slash community hub. And um, a few of us were in, in, down in Christchurch for the uh, local government conference last week, um, Monty and Dale and me, Susan and myself, and just want to, you know, um, endorse that the Christchurch Library is pretty fantastic. Claire and I have seen it together as well over the years um, and would love to see some of the, uh, some of the really diverse um, opportunities for youth that are in, that's in the Christchurch Library. There are sewing machines. Uh, there is a 3D printer. There is a music studio where you can record your own music. Like it's, it just offers more than the standard library. So I guess I just um, yeah, encourage the the community board to continue, um, you know, um, on on that road. But also take a really good look at that library um, in Christchurch because I think it's pretty impressive. Thank you, Lizzie. Yeah. I was actually in Christchurch a couple of years ago and spent some time in Turanga, and it certainly is um, the exemplar of libraries that we would all be hoping to achieve it's very aspirational and as you said it serves all um, different groups in the community which is really amazing and it helps us imagine the library or a library as more than just books which is certainly something that we are keen uh, for Cambridge for our library to serve all people where the books are their favorite thing but that it is kind of that last bastion of social equity and uh, we certainly are keen for our Cambridge Library to, to be aspirational and, and meeting the needs of a whole range of people, all people for our community. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, amazing place to be in. I mean, it's obviously massive, but what they've packed in there is, is pretty incredible and imaginative, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, thanks, Elise. Um, really great to see such a st strong strategic um, focus in your report. And um, really thrilled uh, with the work that you're doing with Shakespeare Street, actually. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess that that's been really highlighted in the um, work that I've been involved in with the Cambridge Connections Group that, that you know, we've got to think about Leamington and how people get over into the CBD and that. So um, I think that identifying that and the work that you're doing there on the community board is, is really fantastic. Um, are you, have you already started any engagement in the Leamington community about what you're trying to achieve? You know, can you give us some feedback on that? Yeah, thank you, Claire. Um, so the main thing in terms of pacing this piece of work has been waiting for those initial designs to come out from the transport team around mm -hmm. uh, that those urban mobility solutions, they're now out with the urban mobility group. So our chair, Joe, has has seen those plans and they'll come to us, I think, at our September meeting. Um, the next couple of weeks, we'll be sitting down as a board and refining our strategy of how we're going to approach the, the Shakespeare Street part of this um, strategic priority. And the, one of those early steps will be sitting down, hopefully, with Brian and making sure that we... Uh, do our engagement with respect of the work that the council staff are already doing. So mm. we're still at the very beginning of that of mm. of that process, and we imagine that over the August, September, October, we'll start doing more um, public engagement mm. in association with uh, the processes that staff are following as well. Yeah, excellent. Um, I think mm. Joe's had some early conversations with uh, businesses around local Leamington businesses about what they'd like to see, but it's very early days at this stage. Okay, thank you very much. No, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to getting updates on it. Actually, yeah, and and right. all the best with it. Thank you. Thank mm. you, Claire. Thank you. And and just as a follow up, Claire, to that. So um, as part of the urban mobility um, group that we've got set up, we've got our reference group, which incorporates a lot of our local uh, Leamington residents and businesses. So we'll be uh, definitely uh, touching base with them as well, because uh, that group was specifically set up to to, to really you know ensure that uh, we we'll get it right. <laughs> and that we uh, connect on all levels, so it's really important. Alrighty, uh, any other questions for Elise? No, thank you, Elise. I think that, uh, that looks like uh, we've um, had all the questions we have. Right, I'd like to invite Ange, the uh, Te Amutu Community Board Chair, to the hot seat. Ange, nice to have you here.
green, so it must be working. Do you want <laughs> it, away. Go for it. <laughs> Got the technology sus today, so um, thank you for having me. Uh, like Elise, um, we'll go with um, the report as read. So are there any questions or anything further? Your report was very thorough, Ange. Um, you guys are, yeah, have a lot on your plate. Um, from what I can see, and um, obviously you're doing a lot of great work um, in the in the community. So yeah, it was really good to have this update. I think this is working very well, actually, that we've got these sort of this formal reporting. So we can um, appreciate the work that you do as well. So I think it's really important. Um, any questions from councillors on the report? Clear. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to say I'm really impressed with all the work that you and your team are doing, actually. It looks like that you're doing heaps. And I guess it's giving greater visibility to council, um, you know, around, around the table here about yeah, exactly what you're doing. And I'm hoping that you're finding the process going well too, you know, this this change and that you're getting good support from the staff and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah so um, sort of like, a, uh, like I've alluded to in our report, it is very much a learning curve and we're working things out um, and sort of finding our way. Um, I think probably the, the, the trickiest thing at the moment is um, working out what we should and shouldn't be involved in because we can't do everything. And, um, you know, like it's been awesome. For example, Kieran will send through what's coming up at council. Um, but, you know, like to try and follow all of that and go, oh, yes, we need to know what's going on there. But then we're also trying to sort of do our own stuff. Um, that is a little bit overwhelming. But I'm hoping that as time goes on, we'll sort of find our niche and be able to fit in and not duplicate. So there's been times where uh, we possibly feel like we're duplicating a little bit. And I think Elise alluded to that with, for example, with what they're wanting to do with their urban mobility. Um, you know, is there a better use of our resource rather than being at the same events that council have already got staff at? Are we better to focus on another part of it and be tasked with looking at another, another bit rather than being uh, doing the same bit? Um, so there's a few things like that to iron out and, and yeah, and as I say, just um, trying to keep tabs on what's going on so that if we need to do something, we can, we're aware, we're knowledgeable and informed um, and are asking the right questions on the behalf of the community. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Angie. Mike. Hmm. Yeah, thank you to the Chair. Here you go, Ange. Hey, just interested in this um, Homes Garage project. Um, just can you tell us a little bit more about it? Um, it's a space for the community for markets but yeah what's the what's it about okay so um the old stewart law building is actually what's called homes garage if you're familiar with that on mahui street um so the tiawamutu business chamber and the tiawamutu retailers um bought that through to community board as a potential space for having a community mark, a covered community market. Um, and so we were really lucky to um, get, um, had a mental block, and this is terrible, seeing as they did the mock-up pictures for us for free, um, the architects down at by TA Club. Um, they've drawn us up some plans just to sort of have a, a bit of a concept idea of what is a possibility of what we could put in that space. Um, Mike Livingston has been super helpful and um, actually provided one of his engineers to have a look at it and said, look, this could be done pretty cheaply. It's actually structurally pretty good. Um, and the um, at this point, um, what we need is for council to say, hey, yeah, we think this is a good idea. We, we are able to let the community use it um, until such times as there's either a better idea or, um, you know, whatever happens from there. Um, but the other, um, other, what's the word I want, um, possibility there is the potential of being somewhere to put the steam engine and the Te Aumutu Lions are actually quite open to that as a possibility as well. Um, one of the things that we've discussed around using that building is the fact that it's it's got a bit of old-fashioned character. It's something that's done um, in the cities um, on the Auckland waterfront. The old wool stores and things mm. have been converted. They look pretty cool. Um, 
we've sort of discussed new versus old, um, and one of our big drivers in supporting it is the fact that um, if we wait for new, um, I've been in Te Awamutu 23 years and I'm still waiting for Te Arawai. Um, and what would bother, what is, you know, like we've recognised there's a need. It came through from Who Are We Te Awamutu um, in that survey. It was something that the community said they'd really like. It's a really affordable way to make it happen sooner than later. Um, and yeah, and yeah. It, it also means um, that there's funds. We're not trying to eat into funds that potentially might be the Cambridge Library. So Cambridge community councillors, you know, you're quite happy to support <laughs> us when this comes back to you guys um, because it can be done in a really affordable way. We're looking at around about 500,000 tops at this point without doing the more in-depth investigation. It sounds like a really good community project mm. and, you know, it pleased the Lions, uh, you know, with the steam engine. But that was, I was going to ask about service clubs and it seems like it would be a great community project because it would actually – we create a little hub and a little hum um, and a point really point of difference for, for, for Te Aumutu. So, yeah, be, best wishes for that project. And that, and that oh, project thanks, will be going to our finance and corporate uh, mm. agenda soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing that I can hopefully am allowed to mention that we have spoken with Ken and I understand that they, um, the team is going to talk with um, whoever's doing concept plans for that area to have a look at whether that would fit in with the overall picture for down there. So, yeah, so that's sounding positive as well. Mm, thanks, Ange. Okay, everybody, any other questions? Andrew. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Angie. You know, it's it's community board and tell me there's really taking off and ramping up, which is fantastic. Um, I just think it's really important that we do look at the concept plans. Um, and um you know that, that, that when we do something that it's uh, going to be consistent and you know what's uh, what's required so i'm very pleased to hear that that's cool great okay oh lou I'll just keep going. Uh, thanks, Ange, for a great report. Just one thing I wanted to mention that uh, we do get a great amount of feedback from our public forum. One of the things that developed very well was that we had our community board actually investigate with all the local sports clubs the proposals put up for the reallocation of what we're going to do, how we manage our sports grounds, and you got pretty significant answers back from just about everything. And I thought that was an excellent piece of public relations where people could come in and actually relate to that. So I just didn't see it in the report, and I thought that's a very good thing to add in um, because I think the, the the fact of life, although they say that volunteers are vanishing, but if we don't keep those volunteers and keep them motivated and operating, we will lose them and the community will lose them. So I think that was a great thing. So well done and congratulations on it. Thanks, Lou. No, it certainly did work really well, and, and those people... Um, Kane and co that went and saw the sports groups did a really good job and um, we even had for example TA Sports come back and present through the community board forum um, and quite a comprehensive report from them so that was that was really good mm, really happy with that thanks Ange. okay all right we've got a recommendation here uh, to receive the report uh, so Mike's going to move that and Lou is going to second that um, all in favour against carried thank you Ange. all right well that look brings us to the end of the meeting i'm going to ask um Dalmore if she'd um close with a karakia but please don't go away we do we're going to start a, we're going to have one quick workshop before lunch okay Kia wātea, kia māma, tinako, te tinana, te wairua, i te aratakata. Koyara, e rongo whakairia, ake kirunga, kia tina, tina. Haumie, huie, tai. Angel's got the waiata. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, okay, we'll, look, we'll just do it. Don't worry. We'll just do it. We'll just do it. All right, everybody, like I said, we've just got one public excluded uh, workshop.